And that's the unrivaled scene on Fishing Boat Harbour in Fremantle as Kookaburra leaves the dock for this battle against Stars and Stripes in a bid to stay in the America's Cup final series. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people not only lining the rocks on the foreshore, but as you can see, clambering to the top of every available building, every available vantage point to cheer, to farewell Ian Murray and Kookaburra and to wish them well in this battle. The big flags flying from the masthead both on Kookaburra 2 and Kookaburra 3. The media boats crowding in as we've seen. The crew acknowledging the waves and look at that. The seven chopper bringing you the scene from overhead and look at the people, still look at them coming down the street there, running, trying to take up some vantage point, trying to catch some glimpse of Kookaburra as she heads out to sea. Forecast today for winds easing off to 10 knots from the east, and if they were to stay that way, it would be ideal for Kookaburra. But the forecast is that the Fremantle doctor will arrive this afternoon. The wind will come up from the southwest at 14 to 20 knots. That's the case, and it'll be conditions very similar to Monday when we saw Stars and Stripes, after a first leg tussle, gallop away to win by a minute 49. What we actually finally spent was way, way, way over those early budgets, and I think every other syndicate uh, had the same experience, and I see now already Australia's talking in terms of $50 million uh, to be in America to win it back, so New Zealand's going to have to look at the validity uh, of this exercise. Uh, did we get the international marketing exposure, the goodwill for our country? Uh, did the sponsors find it a successful experience in terms of their international exposure? exposure? And remember, we would be looking at getting directly into the American market. And uh, can we justify it? And if the dollars and cents add up, and if it's a successful investment here, then my initial reaction would be we could make it a very successful investment in America in 1990 for New Zealand, but it's going to require a lot of work and a lot of thought and a lot of planning on the back of this effort. We always talked about a 15 to 20 million dollar effort and my suspicion is subject to the final mathematics. You know, we're going to be going towards the top end of that figure, which comes out at around sort of up towards 10 million US, which on a comparison of what other syndicates have spent, my information would mean we're probably mounted something like about the third or fourth cheapest effort. I think there are only three syndicates here uh, that managed to do it cheaper than the New Zealand syndicate and uh, in terms of San Diego and New York and some of the so-called American heavyweights uh, they were probably closer to the 30 million US bracket so I think we can do it relatively cheaply uh, and still obtain results that are up there uh, with the best of them and show us as capable uh, of being the winner of this type of regatta. So have you begun already looking for sponsors for 1990? Uh, no, I think what we've got to do first of all is close this exercise off, sit down, uh, go through the debriefing, report to the sponsors, uh, get their input, how successful they found the project to be, uh, what do they want to do, uh, and look re quite closely at New Zealand's approach uh, at large to the American market, because that's what we're talking about now. And it probably provides a quite unique opportunity because there's no doubt the Americans will be watching uh, the men from further down under in terms of coming after what will be probably their most prized sporting trophy in 1990. And it was a pretty small event in America when the New York Yacht Club had a stranglehold on it. Uh, but it's had so much publicity there now that 1990 and the people trying to take it off America will be big news there and it will be a big opportunity for New Zealand, I suspect. In your heart of hearts, a very expensive exercise this time, next time maybe three or four times the cost. Can we really, such a small country, afford that? Well, we afforded it this time, uh, Jane, and I'm convinced at this early stage that it was perhaps one of the best investments New Zealand's ever made. Uh, and if we have to do it next time, uh, we will do it. I think you've got to keep it in perspective. I don't think dollars win this regatta, and I think a lot of syndicates will now be sitting down and looking very hard at how much they spent and where the real benefits lay. And uh, I know inside our syndicate, we've got some big question marks in our mind to just exactly where do you spend the money? What is the real benefit of some of these areas? Uh, and when you put it on a list of priorities, I don't think it's a question of how much money you put at this. I don't think, I think it's a question of how smart you are. And New Zealand's effort this time was done on a very, very small and relatively modest budget. It's a question of talent. It's a question of resource. It's a question of uh, how smart you can be for 1990 and I don't expect 
to see the budgets blow out uh, the way they did between Newport and Perth, uh, between here and 1990. And in fact, I think in some areas, syndicates will uh, be a lot smarter and you might see uh, big budgets talked about, particularly by some of the newcomers uh, who really do see this as a big investment opportunity like the Japanese. Uh, but I think New Zealand perhaps can be uh, relatively modest in its approach to the campaign next time in terms of a financial investment. And uh, I'd have every confidence myself that uh, it's attainable inside something that makes sense relative to the payback for the country at large, the sponsors, uh, and everybody else, because if it's not a sensible investment, I can't see the point uh, in New Zealand being in an event like the America's Cup. Japan's talking $100 million. Well, I don't know where you could spend $100 million on the America's Cup, and I definitely don't think it's the answer to winning it uh, the next time round. Uh, so what we recoup from this one, uh, what equipment we can use, and how carefully we can budget next time will be one of the ways we can make it affordable. Have you had any offers for the boats? We're negotiating at the moment with three or four parties and uh, interestingly enough the list is getting bigger not smaller. There is a question mark over fiberglass and perhaps uh, with the Americans holding the cup it'll be some time before the venue's decided. Uh, in fact it could be anything up to six months. That will affect the type of boat that's going to be appropriate depending on the waters we're sailing in. And there's meetings in Sardinia to look at the scantlings and the supervision of construction and resurvey of 12s and that's not due till June. So, you know, maybe we're just going to have to be a little more patient uh, than we'd like to be in terms of uh, selling those boats. And hopefully the fact that they're very fast and we've seen KZ5 in the fleet race here and we'll see KZ7 in Sardinia, that will keep uh, the interest pretty high in those boats as a starting point for somebody else uh, coming into this business. We don't have to do what we did and what some of the other challenges did, e.g. America 2 this time, and spend all of the time in the U.S. You may do a Dennis Connors, where you do your build up somewhere comfortable that has logical reasons for, for being there. Build up a lot of boat speed in your home waters, learn what your options are, and then go to the United States at a relatively late date, and I wouldn't propose doing it as late as Dennis, but maybe going there six months before the contest um, and do your final build up there. And I think that might have some advantages in terms of keeping people sharp because I would arrive late and have to work hard to get up to speed. Um, so maybe not a large part of your program ends up in the expensive environment of the USA. Now obviously we're not going to have the dollar resources available that some of the other syndicates have, but there's definitely a smartness factor in there. And I think Michael Fay would agree with that, that you can spend a million dollars uh, smartly or unsmartly and uh, that makes a huge difference as well. I think New Zealand has been fairly smart with their expenditure uh, on this campaign. And I think if they pull their socks up and get a little bit smarter and make sure every dollar that's spent is uh, a useful dollar, uh, they can do it. And we did have a lot of support in the rundown, a lot of good wishes, but we need a bit of that for the, uh, for the next one. It's going to be twice as expensive next time around. It's Kevin Parry. Well, there was a fantastic reception for his boys today. 30, 40, 50, 60,000. Think of a number down in Fremantle. And there's a huge crowd out here, at least as, bigger, uh, or as big as there was for day one last Saturday. So we're on the countdown then to the start of the America's Cup as they are now coming up to the 10-minute gun. And there is the gun fired to signify they're on the countdown now for the 10-minute gun. And Kookaburra coming in from the committee boat into the line. The guns fired there by the Royal Perth Yacht Club, Selwyn Irvin, a veteran sailor with 25 years' experience. So the breeze now, the course is for 220 from the southwest buddy, the Fremantle doctor right in, 16 knots. All good news out here today, a beautiful conditions. At another duplicate of a perfect day on Gage Roads. And what we see now is Kookaburra just now hoisting their choice of jibs and uh, going right on at uh, Dennis on starboard tack. They're going to try. He's uh, Peter is dicey. He's all over the race course right now, trying to set him up for a for a prongy. Dennis is going on his windward side. 
So we welcome New Zealand viewers now to the fourth race of the 26th defense of the America's Cup. Will this be the last with the blue boat, stars and stripes, US 55, skipper by Dennis Connor, 3-0 going into this race. Absolutely magnificent conditions out of Fremantle today. The southwesterly or the Fremantle doctor in at 16 knots, not a cloud in the sky. There's a huge spectator fleet out on the water. There's some really big big vessels it's absolutely staggering and it's a horseshoe right around the uh, starting perimeter of the boats now as uh, kookaburra is showing a lot of aggression in a lot of the pre-match interviews uh, ian murray and peter gilmore made it very clear that they would be really working hard on stars and stripes today and doing all they could to get at least one win well, exactly that way. It, it, they got to get after him. They got to get after him. And this is the closest that they've been since they've uh, started this final series. Kookaburra three, right on the tail of Dennis. The bowman up there, McCracken, trying to find out whether or not they've got an overlap. The minute they get an overlap, of course, they're going to ask Dennis to go close haul. Uh, Peter Eisler on the transom of the uh, Stars and Stripes. Uh, just to find the goal boat to come on, get that overlap. The minute they get the overlap, of course, here they come around. Task force now, stars and stripes coming up hard on the wind. The boat you can see, we can literally to reach out and touch Dennis Connor. There's Tom Whitten talking behind, and Kookaburra is going right behind them. We could literally touch both of the boats. Don McCracken, they're right on top. The urgency in the faces. This is great stuff. Peter Gilmore. He's talking back quickly to his tactician and navigator. They are really hunting. The Australians are not giving in as Peter Gilmore takes Kookaburra down to Lewis. They're trying to get underneath. Dennis Connor on the helm. He's looking back urgently. Tom Whitten in the red and white shirt. And Eisler is pre pretty much a fixture on the backstay. He's constantly looking backwards. He wants to make sure when that overlap is established or not established so they can report that back forward to Tom Whitten and Dennis Connor, and Dennis knows what to do according to the rule book to keep his skirts clean. They're going at one another. This is the closest we've seen the two boats in the pre-start maneuvers. And it's just exactly what Peter Gilmore and Ian Mary wants to have happen. They want to go after Dennis. Dennis is playing the game very nicely. He doesn't look panicked. He's got everything under control. And uh, Cooperborough is trying their damnedest to establish that overlap to Lourdes and force Dennis up onto the wind and control him at the pre-start. Harold and Chris, this is great stuff. This is this is good for the Kookaburras, Peter. The uh, stop Stars and Stripes running away from the line too far, so Stars and Stripes is a lot closer to the line than she's ever been before. Kookaburra is right on the tail and controlling on starboard tack, which is very important. While on starboard tack, Stars and Stripes is prevented from tacking. If she tries to tack away, Kookaburra will sharpen inside and prevent that. In the same breath, if Stars and Stripes tries to bear away and jive, Kookaburra can stop them doing that too. So they've got them held a lot closer to the line than normal. Stars and Stripes probably getting a little bit flustered. We know they'd like to keep away from Kookaburra. So uh, Peter Gilmore doing an excellent job on this one. They're about 200 metres back from the start line. The breeze from the right, uh, southwest at around 16 knots. Harold Cutmore, Kookaburra really taking it to them. Yes, Dennis is not so comfortable in these sort of maneuvers. His judgment on the line when he's being pushed hard isn't as good as when he's making a, a timed run from a distance, uh, the Vanderbilt start. This is not the Vanderbilt start. There goes the gun, five minutes to go. Stars and Stripes is away onto Port Tack. Back to you, Peter, you can see it there. Well, now they're coming right back at us, Harold, uh, both on Port Tack with Cooker Burrows and Leward. Still no overlap, so she doesn't have the control she really wants to jam uh, Dennis outside of uh, the right field so that he can control on the way back to the line. Dennis has the uh, freedom to turn as he wishes for the moment, and here they come right at the task force tender once again. They're about 150 meters directly downwind of the committee boat for the Royal Perth Yacht Club officials. Race four of the America's Cup being sailed out of Fremantle, Western Australia. This is really pulsating stuff now. As Stars and Stripes, the blue hull is coming right at us, and they'll shave round right behind 
uh, the Kookaburra tender, again, we could probably reach out and touch them. So there's Dennis Connor with the blue hat on. He's constantly getting information. Peter Eisler has hardly looked forward to the bow at all. He's looking after all the time back towards Kookaburra, and he and Don McCracken a couple of times could have probably put their hands out and shaken hands if that's what they would have wanted to do. So now Stars and Stripes is starting to dive in amongst uh, all of these spectator craft, and there's some really big ships out here, including six big luxury cruise ships, the Achille Laura, the Sea Goddess, the Coral Princess, and also the Love Boat, the Island Princess, but also there are some smaller boats that you can see them diving around now, something around 90-odd uh, tonners, and Stars and Stripes is trying to make it dodge them to escape in amongst the uh, spectator craft as they're getting down to 318, 316. This is really aggressive stuff. How far are they from the starting line, best they're, speed? They're, they're, they're a minute and a half to the line, Harold, and they've got plenty of time. They've got to burn up some more real estate here. They've got to burn up some more real estate. Dennis has lengthened out about three quarters of a boat length, so he has no fear yet. Now uh, we're going to see what Dennis does in these very crucial last couple of minutes to the start. He's, so, he's good at this particular type of start. Over to you, buddy. So they're about 150, maybe 200 meters back from the start line. And as uh, Buddy Mel just said, they've still got to burn up some time at 2.41 to go. As uh, it is Kookaburra in the windward position, the goal boat for Australia, KA-15, down to Leward now. Uh, also on starboard is US-55. They're spilling a lot of breeze out of their main shell as Kookaburra's going down to them. That's right. He's got, he went up initially to force Dennis to come up after him. Dennis did that, slowed his boat a bit, and now Peter tried to tap, establish an overlap to Leward so that he could force him up to the line prematurely. So they're still around 200 meters back from the line, and here's Connor bringing his boat up, and meanwhile, Peter Gilmore's still going down. He's trying to get down to Leward off them, it looks like, buddy. He's just having a devilish time. He can't establish that overlap to Leward that he so dearly needs to push Dennis up and over the starting line, but now, with a minute and 50 some seconds left, it's still Dennis's ball game. He's in control of the Leward. It is not the control of Cooperboro 3. Cooperboro 3 does have to hook that overlap to Leward. Here he goes after it another time. So constantly trying all the time, getting back at Stars and Stripes. The Kookaburras are really trying hard. They're around 50 meters back from the start line at the moment. The breeze, 15 to 16 knots from the southwest. And still, Peter Gilmore hasn't been able to jag it and just get underneath Stars and Stripes to be able to control them as Stars and Stripes is coming up into the wind. That's right. He's pushed, he's shoved, and uh, they're running out of real estate. They're doing just exactly what... Uh, Peter wanted him to do. Peter's in control. Dennis is trying to bear away on a starboard tack. He's slowing his boat up. He's got to hook an overlap now. Dennis has got to get that boat to leeward of him so that he can come back to the line as he so chooses. The start right. line is just about another 40 or 50 meters uh, to windward of um, Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra, and they're running away from the line. That's right, and here comes Kookaburra spinning up on the inside of Dennis in the blue boat. The full boat is upwind. He's pushing Dennis, there's 43 seconds to go, or a little less, and now it's uh, obviously about a 10, 15 second shot to the line. Dennis is in trouble, I believe. He can't use up that real estate with the time he has left. He's gonna have to do something here. Looks good for Kookaburro 3. It's interesting they've pushed them out to the left-hand side, the America's boy into the line. That's right, and Dennis is gonna be a premature starter. I don't believe he can stop his boat that much. They're gonna be over, Kookaburro can tack, and come on down towards the committee boat. Well, it looks like uh, Stars and Stripes is over, and will he bend back? Yes, uh, definitely. Stars and Stripes, Kookaburra is bending back as well behind the line as the gun is gone now. And uh, here they are hardening up behind the, uh, uh, beside the America's Cup boy. This is race four of the 26th defense of the America's Cup. And, and Stars and Stripes right at the boy end. And the race start goes to Dennis. Right at the end, the master shows his prowess in a helm of a 12 meter he just did a trick at the end he was so patient so patient left himself enough room to dive at that america's cup buoy and make peter to the dip onto his uh, hip go below him to clear the line because he had peter upwind of him the start goes to dennis 
So now it is Kookaburra that has moved across onto court to move across to the right-hand side of the course. And uh, Peter Gilmore still on the helm. Stand by Ian Murray will get there anywhere. There's Rick Goodrich with the bandana. Here goes Ian Murray on the helm now as they're on port tack. And to windward of them, but a little further behind, also on port tack is Stars and Stripes. Super stuff by Dennis Connor in the last critical uh, three seconds. So now it is Kookaburra that is tacked, and they're on starboard. The wind is hitting the right-hand side of the boat, so they have right away, but they're too far behind. And already in this first exchange, which is just 100 metres out from the start, in the first minute or so, it is Stars and Stripes clearly in front by a boat length or two, and Connor will tack right in front of Stars and Str uh, of Kookaburra. And Kookaburra's got a bailout. He's got Dennis doing just exactly what he wants. He wants to tack. The more he tacks, the more the favor goes to Kookaburra. You can't let Dennis straight line. They gotta suck him into a tacking duel any way they can. And today, Dennis might just do that because he needs this race to end this series. So now they're working their way uh, it is Stars and Stripes on starboard moving out to the left-hand side of the course. Meanwhile, Kookaburra persisting on port out to the right-hand side of the course for their thoughts on the start. Harold Cubmore and Chris Dixon. That was uh, Kookaburra obviously putting a lot of effort into that one, Peter. Peter Gilmore throwing everything he could at Stars and Stripes. And in that last 30 seconds, it looked like they may have been able to push Stars and Stripes over the start line early. But uh, once again, outfoxed by the master, I guess. Stars and Stripes sneaked in at the boy end with a couple of seconds to spare. And because they'd been pushing Stars and Stripes so hard, Kookaburra was left with no option but to tuck in behind Stars and Stripes and obviously lost the start. I don't think we should uh, jump on Peter Gilmore too hard for that because when you're trying to win a start right up to the end like that, the risk you take is that the other boat will sneak out of it and uh, you lose accordingly. So I think he did everything he could. They weren't able to get what they wanted out of Stars and Stripes, but uh, they're making a match race of it again now. They, they got certainly stars. are. These tacks out here, Chris, if I can interrupt, that looks pretty good for Kookaburra 3 right now. I think they've made up some ground on the right. They got a little fresher air. Dennis is in a bit of a lull over there. I believe that it's going to be very close. Dennis, I don't think we'll tack them. We'll Rem cross them. Excuse Rem me. Remember Kookaburra, here's the right of way. They are on starboard. The breeze is hitting the right-hand side of the boat looking for it. It is Stars and Stripes on port with the breeze hitting the left hand of the side of the boat as they are looking for it. So Kookaburra has the right of way as they are closing at this stage. And Kookaburra does look as though they've got a little bit of a lift or something to be able to get back in the act. Although now as they're closing, it still maybe looks like Stars and Stripes are holding on. They may tack right underneath uh, Kookaburra. So as they're coming up now, this is the second exchange, the second tack. It does look like Stars and Stripes is OK. They're crossing. It looks like maybe a boat length in front. Certainly a lot closer for Kookaburra there, Peter. She is a better boat in acceleration. See Stars and Stripes starting to sharpen a bit towards the wind. And the gap is definitely a lot less than it has been. So this is looking good for Kookaburra, Peter. Or a less than half a boat length there. We see Kookaburra just bouncing through Stars and Stripes quarter wave. A lot closer, but Stars and Stripes realize they're losing. They're not happy with the short tacking. They perhaps think that Kookaburra was favored on the right-hand side, so they've elected to keep going across that right-hand side of the course. But a lot of aggression from Peter Gilmer on the start. They didn't get quite what they wanted, but they're definitely making a match race out of this one. Stars and Stripes leading. We'll be back to see if they can maintain that lead after this break.
They're a third of the way up the speed to windward and stars and stripes at the top of the picture. They are on starboard. Meanwhile, down at the bottom with the black stripes on their sails, that's Kookaburra 3 for Australia. They are on port. And at this stage, stars and stripes looks to have the advantage over the Australians. The breeze has been oscillating around. One minute was coming from 205 degrees, then back to 220 southwest. It really is boxing around the compass, and also there seem to be a few holes out there, buddy. Well, there does seem to be some holes, and what we mean by that is just some calm places on the sea where the wind isn't at the velocity uh, that it is in other places. So getting your head out of the boat and watching for the uh, more blue, dark water is going to be the goal of the uh, advisors behind Ian. He's got to keep that boat in the fresh stuff and push Dennis into those holes. And, buddy, at 14 knots, I guess you'd be telling them if they could listen to you, get your head off the instruments and just keep looking around and sail the boat the way they were taught. Well, that's right. Uh, Dennis, the, the right side is a little sweeter. Not much, a little sweeter. As you can see, when Dennis Tack, he had gained a little bit by uh, Cuckoo being on the left. And now Cuckoo goes back to the left side, and uh, maybe she'll get that oscillation left. It's about that time. These uh, oscillations do seem to go in a sequence of a time that you should be able to time uh, your boat to be on the proper side to take advantage of the wind oscillation and so, come back at them when you get it. So nearly one nautical mile completed of the 24 nautical mile course over eight legs of which there are four beats to windward. This is the first beat to windward into the southwesterly or Fremantle Doctor as it's known locally here. The breeze is around 14 knots. It is predicted to get up to around 20 knots later on this afternoon. It is stars and stripes on port. That's with the breeze hitting the left-hand side of the boat, holding out on going to the right-hand side of the course. Meanwhile, it is Kookaburra 3 for Australia as we're getting a magnificent shot now from from Seven's helicopter looking down on uh, Kookaburra 3. They're holding on to starboard, moving out to the left-hand side of the course. Harold Cutmore, I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts on what happened at the start. In a particular type of start that Dennis has specialized in. So we had Kookaburra coming down against Stars and Stripes. It was very, very fine judgment. My own belief is in the situation the Kookaburra found herself, she should have peeled off about 25, 30 seconds to go and accepted and opted for an even start on opposite tacks. Then well, she could have tacked back shortly after the start on level terms. We need to interrupt her, Harold. Uh, Kookaburra 3 has just gone to a headsail change. She'll be tacking in a moment and dropping that old headsail onto the deck. And we'll see just exactly what's going on here. Obviously, they, they've miscalculated the velocity of the wind, and they've gone now to a fuller head, so they need a little more power so they can get through these lows. So that's Don McCracken on the bow, then it's Ian Burns, who's gone from right aft, just the navigator with the red hat, right up there. And uh, then we've got uh, Tony Bellingham, uh, who is the sewer man, Greg Cavill, back by the mast. So they've taken that head saw down now. So uh, they've changed now and answered all what they feel is uh, a different breeze. Yes, the, the wind is uh, moderated. It's back down to 13. And uh, you can see in the sewer, he's getting that chip put away on uh, the sewer cam of Channel 7. This is a great way for the people back home to see what these guys are doing out there and just exactly how hard they're working to stay on top of the game and live every moment with the crew on board Cooper 3. This is fantastic. Ian Burns losing his hat. This is uh, race cam below decks or sewer cam as it's been known here on the waterfront in Fremantle. Also, uh, Tony Ballingham is the man who works in the sewer most of the time. Uh, perhaps we should call it Ballingham. So now it is Stars and Stripes. They're over a third of the way up this first beat to windward. They're holding on to starboard, and they have a comfortable advantage of a boat length or two, maybe up to three now, over Kookaburra. Perhaps this uh, hits some change may allow Kookaburra to get back into it and start mixing it up. Well, let's hope so. She needs a little more power in the light stuff, and she's gone for it now, and Dennis is still staying with his same head so. Maybe that power will be the difference in these ta this tacking duel that's taking place on us. First windward leg of this fourth race in the 1987 America's Cup. That's good. Stars and stripes as they tacked and went on to port there instantly. Kookaburra back on to starboard. Chris Dixon, you'll be pleased to see that, knowing that Kookaburra is a quick tacker like KZ7. It's, uh, it is good for the cookers, Peter. They uh, need to have stars and stripes do as many tacks up this leg as they can. And gr great to see here stars and stripes going back to cover, and uh, that should cost them a little bit again. 
This is, good, this is good for the kookaburras. Uh, they should be able to take maybe 10 or 15 feet out of Stars and Stripes on every single one of these tacks. So the more they put in, the better it should be for them. Here goes Kookaburra back now on to port. And it's Stars and Stripes and still holding on to starboard. Marlon Burnham, the chairman of the Sail America Syndicate, was uh, made a comment in a radio interview uh, at the end of the third race that he felt that Ian Murray had given up in uh, leg number three, and it's caused quite a, an uproar over here because people who know Ian Murray know that he just doesn't give up. Uh, but Marlon Burnham's point was that Kookaburra didn't tack as much. Well, Chris and Harold, you'd know that uh, at times like that, often the lead boat of uh, Dennis Connor doesn't want to play the game of tacking. It's very hard to mix it up. That's right, Peter. Uh, the boat in front calls the shots. And uh, example now, Stars and Stripes obviously wanted to go to the left-hand side of the course again. Uh, Kookaburra tacked away, and uh, if Stars and Stripes wishes now, she can keep going for another five or seven or eight minutes. If she elects to let Kookaburra go, that's her choice. So Kookaburra can throw in as many tacks as she likes, but she'd look a little bit silly uh, throwing them in on her own, which Stars and Stripes doesn't cover. So we see Stars and Stripes stretching it out again now. Going back for a bit of a loose cover, they, they've let Kookaburra go for a minute and a half, maybe even a little bit more, so that's, that's all Kookaburra can do is reply to each attack that Stars and Stripes puts in. And keep in mind, if Stars and Stripes is picking the wind shifts well and can maybe take a five degree shift one way and then come back on another three or four degree shift, Kookaburra and splitting would be on a three or four degree bad shift, which might open up the lead for Stars and Stripes even more. So. Chris, that's exactly still... what happened out here is that uh, Dennis switched sides. Uh, the compass cars, or the compass wind, went down to 205 from 217 a minute ago. Go ahead, Chris. Okay, so as you said, buddy, that, uh, that wind shift, uh, Stars and Stripes just took two quick wind shifts, and that might be worth uh, maybe another half or another three quarters of a boat length to us. So Kookaburras do have a little bit of a dilemma out there for uh, Ian Murray and, the, and his guys, because if they keep tacking, they risk taking some of those bad shifts, but the only other option is to tack out to windward and behind Stars and Stripes and sail the same course, and that would be playing Stars and Stripes game. So all they're getting is what is left by Stars and Stripes. One thing, we, one thing we know for certain, buddy, is that those guys watching are not half as clever as those guys out there doing it. So, more than halfway down the first leg of this fourth race of the America's Cup Series. Kookaburra trying hard, Stars and Stripes just with the edge. We'll be back after this. Starting from the fairway boy or the America's Cup boy, they're now more than halfway down. The first leg of this course heading for the windward mark and it's Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra going at it, Hammer and Tong and Harold Cutmore. Stars and Stripes had the advantage six seconds at the start, so Kookaburra's doing pretty well. Well, I think if you take in the six seconds at the start, you take in the fact that Kookaburra has changed the Genoa, the margin between the boats is approximately the errors the crew have made. The indications are that Kookaburra has the pace in these conditions, and if there are any conditions she can perform, it's these conditions are lighter. So it's important for Stars and Stripes that they hold Kookaburra off in this leg, otherwise they'll become vulnerable. They're just over halfway up the first beat, and this is a, a crucial beat. Stars and Stripes is not close covering Kookaburra, they feel they're not tacking as well. They're working the oscillations of the wind, but this is high risk strategy. It gives Kookaburra the opportunity to get back to them. On the other hand, Dennis is the past master playing the oscillations. And if Kookaburra misjudges them, they'll perhaps lose ground. Peter, how do you see it out in the water? Well, that's the interesting point, Harold, whether or not uh, it is going to be a situation of uh, Connor letting uh, Kookaburra go, because certainly I would have thought that uh, it would have been better for uh, Stars and Stripes to sit right on top of Kookaburra. That does allow Kookaburra now, as she's coming back onto port, uh, to really put the heat on uh, in a close exchange, uh, because Kookaburra does appear to be able to tack quicker, as indeed New Zealand's KZ7 did. But the breeze now from the southwest up to around uh, 15 knots, so it'll be interesting to see whether or not uh, Stars and Stripes, as they've been able to do, to pick their way through the minefield of oscillations throughout the whole summer. They've been absolutely tremendous and just uh, tacking on those lifts and going about when they're getting broken and uh, with their straight line speed uh, it does appear that uh, Stars and Stripes has been able to uh, uh, dominate throughout the summer because of that and uh, so really it's, uh, it's probably still at this stage it would look as though Stars and Stripes has got the commanding thing as they come up halfway up this first bit. That's right but they have just plugged into about an eight degree uh, oscillation to the left and Kookaburra is on the left side 
it should be her inside on the wheel. And of course, as you know, the axle doesn't have to turn as or go as far as the, the outside wheel. Dennis doesn't like it. He's gonna take a 206 heading back to the left on a starboard tack, when in fact, uh, moments ago, he could have crossed over on a starboard tack with about a 215 heading. He's not gonna let anything more happen from the left. He's going over and stay in touch. Well, it's interesting then, as Harold asked, what we thought was happening was the breeze was switching around. So uh, there was uh, stars and stripes getting knocked, but it does appear as though they've still got a comfortable advantage of uh, two, three, four boat lengths. We'll be able to get an idea as Kookaburra crosses across the wake of the stars and stripes. As they're coming up to around halfway up this first beat to windward, in the breeze from the southwest still around 15 knots. Although the seas are a little flatter than we've had uh, and we'll probably expect for later on in the afternoon. Yes, now we're going to have to sort of hold on to our thumbs here and see if that uh, wedding agent that's on the bottom of Cooka 3 is going to make itself worthwhile on the flat run when that does part of the race does come about. We're about uh, maybe uh, two-thirds of the way up the race course, and uh, Dennis showing his mastery of boat speed once again out here on Gage Road. So as they're coming to cross now, you can see that uh, Stars and Stripes has an advantage of probably three to four boat lengths that would translate out at probably closer to uh, 30 seconds at the stage. Well, I think in this velocity of wind, you're going to figure about six and a half, seven seconds is a boat length. So uh, we can estimate. Uh, Dennis likes that right side of the course yet, so he's uh, he's kissing uh, Cuckoo Barrel hard and fast. It's not a French kiss, mind you, but uh, it is one that sends Kookaburra out back to the left side of the course as she's tacking to starboard. So Kookaburra now is tacked back on to starboard, but at least the good thing for Australia, the good thing for Kookaburra supporters, is that they've got into a close exchange. And so 13 tacks so far with both boats, so it's probably more than they've had in any of the other legs so far. I think they got up to 9 or 10 in uh, race number 2, so Kookaburra is really taking it to them at this stage. And interesting that Stars and Stripes has been wanting to do that rather than sail out to uh, either the left or right-hand side of the course to the ley lines. Well, this is uh, uh, very interesting for Dennis. He is playing the shifts. He is being uh, sort of loose about his cover, but on the other hand, he's tacked more than he ever has, and it's the only way that Kookaburra 3 can really stay in contact with that gun smoke blue. So the breeze from still 15 to 16 knots. Peter, that was a, uh, an interesting transition. We saw Stars and Stripes go through a few minutes back where they had a sh went back to Kookaburra on what appeared to be an unfavorable shift for them. So what they did, they gave away a little bit of their lead, maybe not much, maybe only 20 or 30 feet, but they gave a bit away in order to get back towards Kookaburra. So that's interesting because they're obviously not feeling too happy getting too far away from Kookaburra. So obviously some good oscillations out there, which when Stars and Stripes gets them right, makes it look good, but uh, we saw her get a couple wrong back there and they're obviously not so happy about letting Kookaburra get two or three minutes off to any side as we've seen them do in previous races. So maybe that's why they are doing a lot more tax is because uh, they don't want Kookaburra to get a big shift uh, and have them s and miss out on it themselves. So interesting, they are obviously feeling very vulnerable. They don't feel that uh, they have so much boat speed that they can just burn off to their own side of the course. And Kookaburra and tacking back on the hip like that is obviously feeling quite confident with their own speed that uh, they may not be any quicker, but they feel that they're definitely not any slower, and therefore keeping in touch with Stars and Stripes, putting the pressure on Dennis Connor and the team may make Stars and Stripes come back a little more often than usual. That shot we saw just before showed Kookaburra to be sailing very high again, and maybe picking up on a shift again that Stars and Stripes has missed out on, even though they're only a few boat lengths apart. Well, Sports Tech really shows how uh, Ian Murray's been dogging Stars and Stripes up this leg, Harold Cudmore. Stars and Stripes in yellow, uh, in red, Kookaburra in yellow. The windward mark is the bottom left-hand side of the screen. You can see the series of tacks and where Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra went apart, just where those lines go apart, and where they come together is where Stars and Stripes is tacked in Kookaburra. They're both boats tracking back in towards the middle of the course, and Kookaburra just to windward. I suspect Stars and Stripes, if she has good speed in Kookaburra, will just stay there towards the ley line. There they are again, Stars and Stripes ahead to leeward, Kookaburra behind to windward at the bottom of your screen. Buddy? Well, 
the, at the moment, the breeze is 204, 205. You saw on Sports Tank that the heading was 220. So, yes, Chris and Harold, the breeze has been oscillating around uh, a lot, hasn't it, buddy? Uh, up to 15, 20 degrees, and it's switching back and forth quite a lot. And Dennis has been using this to use in his cover so that he can be uh, sort of a relaxed, but yet keep in contact, keep between uh, his competition and the windward mark. That's all he wants to do. He wants to stay in touch, and he's going back to his uh, uh, thoughts of his downwind superiority. We got to see whether or not he still is going to maintain that today. With the wind increasing, we're up over 17 knots now. So uh, I'm wondering if that jib change is maybe this last little bit, last five minutes of windward work, is going to affect the position of Cooperbro, whether or not she's uh, going to lose a little more real estate to Dennis. It's going to be interesting to see. Dennis is smoking, boy. Gunsmoke Blue is really flying up the race course right now. She looks good. Lively bow wave, good transom wave, and uh, I don't know. It's going to be a tough nut for uh, Cookerboro 3 to crack out here on Gage Roads today. Between 800 meters and 1,000 meters to go for Stars and Stripes in the lead over Cookerboro on this first beat to windward of the fourth race of the 26th Defense of the Americas Cup before they round the first mark. Stars and Stripes in front. We'll be back after this break. Two to three hundred meters to go for Stars and Stripes to round the top mark and so complete leg number one, three and a quarter nautical miles directly into the eye of the Fremantle Doctor, the Southwester, that's directly coming to us. And really in the final stages here, buddy, the familiar picture of Stars and Stripes moving away. It seems maybe just to have a fraction more boat speed from the Australian perspective. It's simply a case of... Uh, they, they just can't, uh, if you haven't got any socks, you can't pull them up. In other words, uh, if Kookaburra is only at 8.3 and the Stars and Stripes is at 8.5, the Stars and Stripes will just sail away from them again on the wind? Well, it's not sail-shaped. And as you say, if you don't have the socks, you can't pull them up. That's a, just a pure analysis that there's no horsepower in the hull to the degree that Dennis is enjoying. The strength and weaknesses out here, I believe, are in the hull. I do not see them in the sail shape. The sail shape on both boats is excellent. Dennis has set up for a barrelway set, and it's going to be interesting to see exactly what Kookaburra 3 does. Uh, I don't think we have that big oscillation of wind. In fact, it probably would pay with what I see on our compass right now, uh, wind compass, that is, the wind direction that a, a Barrel, a jive set would be okay. And there goes Dennis around the mark. Spinnaker is being pulled out from under the jib foot. And as you notice, it's uh, the, the yarn has to break. They put yarn around those spinnakers to keep them under control so the air doesn't get them or the sea doesn't get them. 
Not a bad set at all. And uh, here comes uh, Kookaburro also with a fairway set. You can tell a fairway set by the fact that they have the pole up and in position on the starboard side of the headstay. And here comes their finicker out. Let's see if they can beat Dennis on the field. Looks good, looks good. Lovely set. Nice crew work on both boats. And as I said before, and I think we all agree to, that crew work is not what is making the difference. The sail shape is not what is making the difference upwind out here. It is just simply uh, the gun smoke glue hull is great. So as they set off now in leg number two, this is the spinnaker run. This is the test of the wind coming from directly behind. And the Stars and Stripes was leading by five seconds at the start. Marvelous stuff by Dennis Connor. And then at the first mark, Stars and Stripes has moved out to 26 seconds. That was a really good beat to windward for Stars and Stripes, particularly in the final half of that leg. At this stage, we farewell New Zealand viewers and expect you to join us later on in the afternoon. So, Chris, uh, your thoughts on that final stage of the Windward Beat as the familiar sight of Red, White and Lee. You've seen it all before, haven't you, taking off downhill? Certainly a familiar sight, Peter, and uh, obviously a little bit disappointing for the Kookaburras. They, uh, they hung on as best as they could up the uh, second half of that beat, and as we saw uh, by sailing on Stars and Stripes' hip for the, the last five minutes or so, the breeze was obviously a little bit in the left, and uh, they didn't have any option but to do that. So, uh, as Buddy said, excellent uh, sets on both boats. Crew work is right up there, and uh, we'll see how that bottom coating is working on Kookaburra on this downwind slide. It's uh, going to be a long starboard jibe and a short port jibe, so hopefully uh, if that bottom coat is uh, working for the cookers, they may be able to take a bit of time out again, but they've got their work cut out in this one. Stars and stripes there on the left of the screen. Again with a big spinnaker, we're back on board, Kookaburra, the Sevens race camp. And really, the, the options to them are not very many. They've gone away at the same jive. Kookaburra will find it very difficult to close in on the Stars and Stripes because of the quarter wave that comes off the back of the boat that throws a wash behind these boats. She may, if there's an oscillation in the breeze, decide to jive away and split jives with Stars and Stripes. But because there's a bias to one jibe rather than the other, she'll probably wait another perhaps five, six minutes before doing so, and then try a tactical option of, of jibing away and seeing can she work some shift. Difficult position for the boat behind. What she is in fact doing is she's lifting out to windward, attempting to get outside that quarter wave. You see the water that comes from the corner stars and stripes, about 60, 70 degree angle from the back of the boat. You can just make it out behind the boat. Well, that's the quarter wave. Now, uh, Kookaburra is inside that, which means, well, behind is the expression, but in between both of those. It's very hard to sail through that. You can see the same waves coming out the, behind, the back of Kookaburra. Uh, one option is to go to the right of Stars and Stripes, try and cast a wind shadow, get outside that wave, and uh, this is a, an attack maneuver. The other option is to jive now, cross that quarter wave, the left-hand side, get into clear water, and sail her own race. She's opting to go the right-hand side at present. I don't think she'll gain a whole lot here. She'll probably hold it for a couple of more minutes so she's directly up with the mark and then try an aggressive maneuver. Back out to the, on board, buddy. Well, the interesting thing out here is that the spectator wash is going right on out to those boats going dead down the wind now, Harold. Uh, they're, they're on our port side running down the wind. The northern fleet has definitely affected the race course, and uh, obviously I think it's eliminated the possibility of a jibe set for any kind of an offensive weapon. Notice also the white caps becoming more apparent, the wind now up to 20 knots, and the seas are getting lumpier. They have become much more so in the past uh, 15 minutes. The breeze also around to 2.30 at this stage, so it's boxing around the compass from 2.20 back to 2.05. 203 and then now round back to 220 and US 55 looking very impressive sailing off the wind now really it's become quite a surprise because uh, in the Louis Vuitton final against New Zealand on the average times both running in this condition and also reaching uh, New Zealand was quicker downhill than US 55 and a lot of people expected that Kookaburra after the trials would be able to uh, 
least hold or take time out of uh, stars and stripes off the wind. Derek Clark, the, uh, the tactician with the white hat, right aft. He was involved with uh, Victory 83 uh, as tactician with the last British challenge. It was lured down under to the magnificent climate and sailing conditions out off Fremantle and uh, is now qualified for Australian citizenship to be able to sail for Australia in this America's Cup. And uh, that's Greg Cavill, whose face is becoming as well known as uh, Mr. Hawk across Australia. And uh, he's just getting rid of uh, a little bit of water. Meanwhile, on the left with the bandana, that's Rick Goodrich. And uh, to his right is uh, on the port grinder is Darren Bracewell. Meanwhile, further aft there in the red hat is Ian Burns, the navigator. We see him right aft, and he's putting in all the input. He's a, an engineer, a qualified Bachelor of Engineering from um, Sydney University. But at times like that, he's got to uh, work on the main sheet with Peter Gilmore. And then, uh, as we've seen many times in race cam below the decks, it's Ian Burns who's also hauling in the spinnaker. So uh, the life of a navigator is not all that glamorous all the time. Back in the afterguard, just giving input to the skipper. As Kookaburra 3 now is chasing stars and stripes on the second leg of this fourth race of the America's Cup. And stars and stripes is set to go for their fourth gun and take the America's Cup. We'll be back after this break. and that's how much they've completed from the start at the fairway boy around the first windward mark and now coming up on the halfway point on the first downwind run in this fourth race of the America's Cup Series. Out on the water, Stars and Stripes, we can see from the aerial view Dennis Connor at the helm. They're in good shape, leading reasonably comfortably now. At this point, 26 seconds was the margin around the first mark ahead of Kookaburra after Stars and Stripes, of course, had won the start. It might be an idea, I think, to uh, have a look at a replay of the start. Jeff Merrill, our race analyst, has uh, joined me here in the studio, and uh, we're going to uh, talk it out over the start. Of course, again, Peter Gilmore applying plenty of pressure, chasing Dennis Connor, but at the last minute, that wily old fox, Dennis Connor, the most experienced America's Cup helmsman of them all, managed to get out of jail and win the start. Exciting start, Gary. They both uh, mixed it up a little bit. Dennis was sailing away from the line with 714. They went around a spectator boat. Peter Gilmore on the chase. Peter Gilmore doing everything he could to engage Dennis Connor. Dennis Connor having nothing to do with it, running away, doing what Buddy would call an Amy Vanderbilt. They came back into the spectator fleet for one more pass of the crowd with about three and a half minutes to go. Kookaburra driving behind Stars and Stripes in this picture, forcing Dennis back to the line before Dennis wanted to get back there became a game of time on distance and of overlapping. Kookaburra 3 trying to get the lured overlap, forcing Dennis Connor up to the start. You see the bowman on Kookaburra 3. Then they came into the uh, starting line with less than 20 seconds and overlap. Does Dennis Connor have enough room to make it before the gun goes off? He pulls it off. He comes in with a master of time on distance and you can see right at the gun, he shoots it up and he's able to cross the line ahead of Kookaburra 3. Kookaburra 3 can only take the bad air right now get up enough speed to tag. Dennis Connor crossed the line five seconds ahead of Peter Gilmore and Kookaburra 3. Peter Gilmore tacked over, appeared to pick up a little bit of breeze, but when they came together on the first upwind leg a minute or so into the race, Dennis Connor had it tacking in front of Kookaburra 3, and uh, that's where the start was won. Well, from there on, there were about uh, 15 tacks as Ian Murray pursued Dennis Connor down that uh, first leg, but it was Connor around the first mark by 26 seconds. Harold Cutmore, Buddy Mel just says, 
It's not, there's nothing wrong with uh, the Kookaburra sails, there's nothing wrong with the crew, uh, the sails that aren't making the difference on board Stars and Stripes, it's the hull. But what about Dennis Connor? He must have a pretty uh, big input into this decision, I think. Uh, I was on the race course, you mm. mean, is it? I think today's start was poor for Peter Gilmore, but he had to be aggressive, he had to try something. He lost one and a half boat lengths. Subsequently, they decided to change General Cross from another boat length. So there were two and a half boat lengths they gave gratuitously to Dennis. But still, they rounded the top mark, probably five boat lengths behind, something that sort of order. Therefore, the indications are the boat was slower by two and a half boat lengths. And it's very hard to be clever tactically when you just don't have the, the speed. I'm afraid it's a design problem. Last couple of uh, races, of course, on the downhill run, Dennis Connor has defied the early predictions, has, has been so much faster than Kookaburra. Uh, if that uh, five lengths, 26 seconds is correct around the top mark, then it looks like uh, Kookaburra is holding on reasonably well on this first downwind run. We'll be back after this break to double check. They've covered something more than five miles on this 24 nautical mile race. Fourth race of the America's Cup Series. 26 seconds, the margin to Stars and Stripes around the previous mark. They're on the first downwind run. And Kookaburra is hanging on to the tail of Stars and Stripes pretty well. Jeff Merrill, our race analyst, is still with us. And, uh, Jeff, you've come up with some pretty hard-looking statistics there about uh, Kookaburra's race record through this summer. Well, it's, it's deja vu again for Kookaburra with Stars and Stripes today. Prior to the America's Cup final, Kookaburra 3 had only lost four races from start to finish all summer long, and she'd never lost a race by more than 50 seconds. Now, everybody knows the story now. She's lost three in a row, all by minutes of over a margin of one minute, and uh, it's not looking too good right now. It's, it's uh, pretty hard numbers against Kookaburra so far. Let's see uh, how it looks from uh, Buddy Melger's perspective out on the water. Well, it's, it looks good for Kookaburra. Uh, three on this flat run, the first flat run of this fourth race, maybe that coating is at least holding her with uh, the gun smoke blue. But going back to the start, gentlemen, uh, I felt that possibly once those boats came to nearly a dead standstill with about 25 seconds to go, Peter may have gone on to port tack, Dennis would have had to follow, or stay at that end of the line. He didn't have enough uh, real estate down there to get his boat up to speed. I wonder, gentlemen, would that have been his other alternative? My view certainly was he should have tacked. I had said about 30 seconds ago, but 25, that's OK with me. I'd allow him time to get up to speed, cross the line, although he'd lose the bias. I think there was a bias at the buoy end. That means it's like the buoy end was closer to the wind than the boat. But if he had gone across the line at best speed, and when he tacked back on the starboard, of course, he'd have right of way. 
So there's a fighting chance he could get back to Stars and Stripes uh, and force her to either dip or tag. Chris, what do you think? Uh, exactly right, Harold. Uh, Kookaburra took a risk there by staying where they were. Peter Gilmore uh, decided that it was probably worth the risk, but what they ended up with was uh, a boat length behind. Plus, they're also slow, so I think they probably lost at least one and a half, maybe even two boat lengths on that start. But a little bit like uh, going tiger hunting, I guess. You've got the tiger in the cage, which you can't close the door without going in yourself. And uh, something you've got to do, and you risk getting your hand bitten off. And I think that's what happened to the cookers in that one. They, they had Dennis where, where they wanted him and were pushing him towards that starting boy. But uh, in order to keep him going, they had to stay there themselves. And the, that was the risk they took, and it didn't come off. So sure, they uh, could have tacked away with 20 or 30 seconds to go, started on the line with a lot of, a lot of speed, uh, and come out with an even start. But We've seen them come out with even starts of, on the previous three races, and as we all know, it doesn't do them a lot of good. They needed to win the start. They forced it right to the end. They didn't get it, but I think it was a gamble they had to take. And so, like, coming down to the bottom mark, it is now up to 22 degrees, and the, the breeze is coming from 227, uh, switching around a little more to the right, and Stars and Stripes has got around 200 metres to go to complete leg number two. That's uh, just over six miles of the 24-mile course. There are eight legs in this race, and they're coming down to complete the second one, the run under Spinnaker. Four beats to windward, two directly with the breeze behind them, and two reaches. Do you think Kookaburra's gained a little, buddy? Well, she certainly stayed the same. It's one of her best runs that she's had against Dennis uh, since this series started. Dennis is making his final port tack approach to the America's Cup buoy, and to begin the third windward, uh, third leg and the windward leg of this fourth race, which in all uh, outlook right now is getting a little bit bleak for Kookaburra 3. She's going to have to get mean in order to save the cup for Australia. Now, you may have noticed a little yacht just steaming up directly into the breeze, thinking that uh, there's some enthusiastic spectator has got out of the way. In fact, that is a Royal Perth Yacht Club yacht, and they are indicating that there has been a course change. Uh, it looks like 2-1 something. We just can't quite get what that is, but uh, once we get that confirmed, uh, it's just a, a small modification of just a few degrees, but uh, at least they're indicating that to the boats. So Stars and Stripes now is coming down to the mark still carrying their spinnaker. They'll be doing around uh, 11 knots. They've really been working hard as uh, they've been pumping their uh, spinnaker and their mainsail. They've got the idea and the technique off uh, Kookaburra and Australia 4 in the finals. They noticed that the Australians really had a kind of dinghy approach to sailing off the wind and uh, was very much more aggressive than uh, they had seen in the challenges or certainly that uh, Stars and Stripes had been doing. And uh, so... Uh, stealing the idea is really perhaps backfiring against the Australians because uh, Stars and Stripes has uh, certainly improved their performance off the wind. Whether or not it's just the, the technique or something else they've had up their sleeve, uh, we're not sure. So coming down now to the uh, Fairway Boy, as it's been known, out on Gage Road, uh, dropping the spinnaker, now renamed the America's Cup Boy. And Stars and Stripes rounding the mark to go directly into the eye of the wind to where they have come from. And down below is Ian Burns hauling in the spinnaker on Kookaburra 3 as hard as he can go. He probably needs arms about another four or five feet longer to be able to get it in as quickly as possible. And so they round the mark and they have gained definitely some distance. They're down now to 22 seconds. So Kookaburra has taken some time out. That's around three boat lengths. So they certainly are in uh, distance now of uh, at least trying to attack against Stars and Stripes. So let's recap the race so far. Stars and Stripes taking the start with that magnificent performance by Connor right in the last 10, 15 seconds uh, to be able to win the start by five seconds. On the first beat to windward, they were 26 seconds in front. And on the downhill slide, they've taken four seconds out of Stars and Stripes going into leg number three and the breeze up to 22 knots. This is a great uh, day out here now and it's going to be uh, moving more and more into Stars and Stripes weather. Here they go over onto the starboard tack and exactly what we need to have 
Engage, engage. That's Cooper Burrow's race. You got to keep Dennis engaged, keep him uh, off his straight line courses so he cannot build that speed. And uh, they ought to go into a, uh, you know, down speed tax now is the name of the game in my estimation. And that lighter boat ought to be able to get back up to speed just a bit quicker. And here we go. Is Greg Temple pulling on the tacking line? Meanwhile, the grinders are really pumping at Rick Goodrich and Darren Bracewell. They've got help there from uh, Tony Bellingham and Don McCracken who have come back. And Dennis Connor is tacking on top. Also going back to port to cover uh, Kookaburra now as uh, the breeze getting up to 22 knots. You can see the sea getting a little lumber. Here goes Kookaburra going back on to starboard. They're really taking it. And maybe they're going to go through those low speed tacks, buddy. Well, that's their big hope. Uh, Kookaburra 3 is going to try and get Dennis to engage, but he's not taking the bait. He's continuing on the port tack to build up to his 825, 83 uh, hull speed that he dearly loves to sail in that, uh, no, those numbers and get those numbers now, and that'll begin to make uh, some real estate difference between the two boats. So as we look across from the Kookaburra tender, an absolutely magnificent sight of Stars and Stripes just going through the lifting sea here and looking across to KA-15 Kookaburra holding on to starboard, moving out to the left-hand side of the course and still persisting to move out to the right-hand side of the course, uh, Stars and Stripes. Uh, Chris and Harold, do you think Stars and Stripes should have come back to cover? Or again, well, the same old thing? Is Are they so confident of their boat speed and uh, getting the advantage on the lifts? Well, Peter, uh, good point. Every, uh, every book of match racing that uh, we've ever seen says that Stars and Stripes should be coming back. They should be covering Kookaburra, but... As we've seen all summer and certainly right through this America's Cup, Stars and Stripes has a totally different book from the rest of us. They let the other boat go, they go off and sail their own race. And uh, they do it with confidence, but it means that they do leave themselves open. If, for instance, now Kookaburra does get a, a 10 degree shift or even a 5 degree shift, when the boats are so far apart, a 5 degree shift over that distance could mean up to two or even three boat lengths. So I think uh, Stars and Stripes is doing what they always do, is sailing their own race. They threw in a, a few tacks, which they didn't like, and now they're back to sailing straight lines again. Harold, what's your impression of Kookaburra going back with them now? Probably a little bit early, considering the position she was in. She might have pushed a little bit further, but then again, the wind could have changed a little bit. It's hard for us to see it from here. The one uh, aspect of that that is probably more relevant in the America's Cup than there is, than is in the trials is the fact the spectator wash is probably bigger. And that spectator wash might be affecting on the starboard tack close to the leeward mark. Yeah, it could well be. We saw uh, those first few tacks, both boats look to be going through very, very lumpy seas. And maybe uh, Stars and Stripes doesn't like the chop. We know that she hates the chop. She enjoys the flat water and uh, quite possibly going back towards the middle of the course in order to get some, some flatter ocean. But uh, certainly surprising that they have let Kookaburra go so early in the second beat where they really probably don't need to. But uh, what that does, it gives Kookaburra a, a glimmer of hope still. It gives them a chance of getting back into this race. And uh, if they've got even comparable speed, uh, being out on one side does give them the chance of picking up a shift that Stars and Stripes doesn't get. Kookaburra dogging Stars and Stripes up the second windward beat, the third leg of this fourth America's Cup race. Do or die today for Kookaburra. We'll be back after this. Thank you. 
two legs completed. They're on the third leg of this America's Cup course. And uh, there you see Kookaburra and Stars and Stripes. And it looks like they're uh, coming together again. And Kookaburra still holding ground pretty well behind Stars and Stripes, having been 22 seconds behind around the previous mark as we take you back out on the uh, course to Peter Mon Commentator. Well, as the breeze has uh, freshened up to uh, 19, 20 knots and the seas are getting lumpier, Dennis Connum just back into his awesome mode again that really is uh, quite frightening for the other uh, 30 or 12 challenges and uh, also the other defenders, although Kookaburra is the only one who's had a, a crack at him because the breeze now round to 200, 201 and uh, really Dennis Connor in his role, he's just taking off, buddy. He certainly is, Peter, and you know, we've talked about the crew work and we've talked about the sales. It's interesting to know that uh, Task Force uh, Challenge built most all of their sales right in uh, Frio uh, with the use of North uh, Sail technology. Uh, this is, is a pretty unique uh, situation. I think that the uh, uh, Kookaburros have really developed their sail shape to the ultimate. And Dennis has taken a page from their book when in fact he up and uh, set up a sail loft right across the street from Stars and Stripes uh, dock space and began to build sails. And in this final uh, match race series for the America's Cup, Dennis in fact has built most all of the sails right here in Frio that have been out there performing so well for him. I'd like to take this time to congratulate those kids back in the loft, and especially Vita for doing a super job. The fourth tack there for Stars and Stripes, and there are the big grinders, Kyle Smith and Jim Cavley, really pumping on it with a little help there from Jay Brown and John Barnett. Meanwhile, back on the uh, Kookaburra tender, we've got uh, Peter Gilmore with the green help. There's Darren Bracewell just in front of him, and Rick Goodrich is down right underneath the uh, grinders with the bandana on. Tony Bellingham, he is the uh, sewer man or the mask man, and uh, he's just right uh, with his head tweaking out. Meanwhile, going right up on the top uh, windward side, there was Greg Cavill, whose face we've seen a lot. There's Darren and Bracewell now just moving back and sitting back. And um, Derek Clark right out there with the white cap. And uh, he is the fellow who has two uh, degrees, one in nuclear physics and one in engineering. And he is the tactician and has a very sophisticated understanding of hydrodynamics and aerodynamics. And no doubt he's made a comment to his uh, uh, skipper that just how stars and stripes may have a better hole shape and quicker through the water. Then there's the distinctive uh, look of Ian Murray. who gets a bit of a crick in his neck, depending on what board he's on, be it starboard or port. But they're still concentrating hard, doing their best, just right behind uh, Derek Clark and Ian Murray in the red hat. That's Ian Burns, who's a graduate from Sydney University. He's the navigator. He's had a very illustrious career in Hobie Cats, which some people may wonder how on earth does he get aboard a 12 metre, because a little catamaran of 14 to 16 feet is very different to the kind of machine they're sailing at the moment. But uh, he, like Grant Simmer, who is also a graduate of Sydney University, the tactician, or rather navigator aboard Australia 2 and Australia 4. There is very much a trend in recent times to get bright intellectual young men who can understand the number crunch and you've also almost got to be as much a, a computer programmer as uh, anything to be able to understand the modern age and technology uh, aboard these 12 meters. So Peter Gilmore there with the light shade, green shade, he's had terrible problems with blistered lips all summer. So in his 47th and last race, it appears, out on Gage Roads, uh, he'll be able to have a little rest. And down to Lewis there, that's uh, Paul Westlake, uh, who sailed with Ann Murray on the advance campaign and sailed uh, on Bondi Tram, the top boat in the uh, Clipper Cup uh, a couple of years ago, and also was with Peter Gilmore, member of the Green Shade, and Ian Murray and uh, Paul Westlake here. The three of them won the 1984 World Etchel Championship with little or no build-up to it. So some really talented sailors aboard, and I think that's the important thing uh, for Australia to understand, as Buddy keeps emphasising, uh, the crew work on board this boat is excellent. Certainly a lot has been made of the experience aboard Stars and Stripes, but we've been able to intrude upon the privacy of uh, this crew and see how good they are. And, 
and uh, they are very good indeed and the sales are excellent and really the reason why these folks are doing 8.3 knots maybe 8.4 and their rivals are doing 8.5 8.6 probably comes down in fact to uh, hull shape in the end buddy well hull shape and uh, the wing feels that uh, yeah. were made so famous by ben lexon's australia too when he took the cup from the americans in 1983. Obviously, that made Dennis and the rest of the Americans quite disturbed over the fact that they had lost the technology edge in 12-meter uh, sailing. And 12-meter sailing is uh, design of boats, design of sails, and the information uh, that you gain from the computer to analyze uh, the performance of your boat against everybody else. If there was one thing that Dennis has done better than everybody else here was to stay in touch with the outside world. And I think in some cases, uh, too much security, isolation, whatever you want to call it, can come back to haunt you. And I think some of that's happened uh, here with the defenders, that they were not uh, enough alert and aware to see what the other troops were doing uh, with their hull shape that they might have countered with uh, another change and uh, modification and in aluminum hull construction, many, many things can be done in a very, very short period of time. But uh, right now, these two boats are staying in contact out here on Gage Roads. There's only about three boat lengths difference, and Ian is hanging tough. He's hanging tough today, and who knows what we'll bring on the two reaching legs. Maybe they've got something up their sleeve from yesterday's uh, uh, rest day and, and sort of reconstruction of the first three races in their own minds. What can we do, boys, to make this boat go faster? And that's, I'm sure, what they're going to try to pull out of their arsenal this afternoon. Back to you, Peter. Yes, so now we can see uh, Stars and Stripes holding on to port, and here's Kookaburra 3, KA15, holding on to starboard. They're moving out to the left-hand side of the course, but it looks any moment, here goes Big Dennis, covering as indeed he should. And that's the point that Chris and Harold has made before, that in every book written about yachting, and particularly match racing, or and even fleet racing for that matter, stay between your nearest rival and the mark. And that's exactly what Stars and Stripes now has done. Meanwhile, here goes Kookaburra, tacking back, and this can be uh, their hope as uh, we're looking directly out on them, absolutely magnificent view from the Kookaburra tender uh, within uh, 100 metres of them and uh, also some other chase boats in the privileged zone with the big blimp right on top. Uh, they'll be getting some spectacular pictures of that. So now it's Kookaburra moving back onto a port and it's uh, Stars and Stripes assisting to hold on to starboard as they're moving out. The breeze is 18, 19 knots. It's around uh, 195, 196. So... Uh, Really, I think uh, one of the other interesting things, and it'll be fascinating, buddy, but we'll hear from Chris and Harold first, is about uh, Dennis Connor. It does seem to me, having watched uh, 47 races out here, of which uh, um, eight plus four, 12 of them have been watching Dennis Connor. Chris, the, the harmony that Dennis seems to be able to have with the elements sailing his boat through the waves is really very impressive. Well, Peter, Harold here, I'll pick up on that one. and. In fact, I was thinking uh, about Dennis. I was, I was asked to do a, a short pen sketch of him for the London Times for tomorrow, and uh, it forced me to sort of think about the character he is. And as you look at his sailing, and his sailing he is a master at, I actually look at his underlying talents and what makes him such a winner. What makes him such a winner is, above all, his thoroughness. His approach is so systematic, I think it's a, perhaps a trait from his German ancestors, of which he's very, his ancestry, which he's very proud. And that, above all, is, is one of his strongest. He has the other aspects you have to have Amer uh, for America's Cup skipper. You have to have leadership, you have to have an analytical mind, and you have to have all the other things necessary. But I think above all is this thoroughness, and that starts very early on in the program. So some years ago, when he was shocked by the loss of the America's Cup, he had six or seven days, he said, and then he began to think again. And as he approached the problem, he, above all, had to face the empty sheet of paper and decide how to bring that cup back. And that's where his talents came to the fore. That's where he set up a structure, an organization, a, an approach, a philosophy that drove on forward through an enormous technical program, I believe numbered well over 100 people involved at its zenith, producing his two original boats. He modified one into effectively a new boat and three further new boats, this final 
absolutely dominating boat, the boat that has won here by such large margins. It not alone has surprised everyone, I think it has shocked the competitors. So underlying his sailing ability here and all the other things he does is the fact he's been so thorough in his preparations. Harold, let's hear from Dennis Connor himself about what he believes the skills are that are required to be a good helmsman. Well, a good concentration and, uh, is certainly important. But uh, I, I think that uh, you have to have a background in small boats to uh, really get a feel for what the boat likes and what it doesn't like. And if it has too much helm or not enough helm or too much trim on the sails, I think a good background in small boats is, is important. And uh, at this level of the sport, everyone is very, very good. And uh, they're all terrific sailors. So it's hard to say what is the difference between uh, one and the other. It's probably very, very little difference is the answer. So who's better between uh, uh, one race car driver and another in the Indianapolis 500? The answer is very little difference. Dennis Connor, the man in the box seat, three victories under his belt and leading Kookaburra down the third leg of this fourth America's Cup race. We'll be back to pick up on the action after this. Back at Fremantle, there's been a mishap of uh, some dimension out there among the spectator fleet. That's one of the larger uh, power boats that's been out there. And of course, there have been dozens and dozens of boats out there milling around this morning. And one of them, by some manner of means, has gone over. Not sure how it's happened. The uh, Marine and Harbour Patrol vessels are in close proximity out there. They've got it in tow. It's been badly holed by the look of it. How the devil that had happened, I don't know. We'll get uh, some news on that later, perhaps. Let's get back on the uh, race course and see how things are going. And they're two thirds, three quarters of the way up the third leg, the second beat to Windward Stars and Stripes leading Kookaburra. The margin around the previous mark was 22 seconds. And when uh, Dennis Connor leads around the second mark, Jeff Merrill, he's a pretty hard man to stop. Absolutely, Gary. Uh, Dennis has won 96% of the races he's sailed in when he's led at Mark II. On Kookaburra's uh, hand, though, this was the first time they've made a gain on the first downwind leg, the first run. They picked up four seconds, so maybe it's going to change the fortune around a little bit. But uh, Dennis is pretty formidable once he gets ahead at that second mark. Chris Dixon, is Kookaburra still in close enough uh, touch to, to force the issue here? She is, but only just, Gary. Uh... They actually have uh, a long way to go on starboard tack. That's the tack that Stars and Stripes is on right now. So they've probably got about uh, ten, seven or eight minutes to go on starboard and only two or three minutes left to go on port. So Kookaburra is being forced out to the uh, out to the wrong or out to the direction that she's got least time to go. 
And uh, that'll mean Stars and Stripes will just keep pushing her over towards that time. Kookaburra has to keep coming back. The spectator wash isn't far away. And uh, that may get a little more expensive for Kookaburra as she gets further, further up the track. But uh, they're hanging on. They're, uh, they're not, they haven't taken anything out of Stars and Stripes. In fact, they have just gradually dropped back. But they are close enough for the shifting conditions out there to be able to uh, create a little bit of a, a, an issue for Stars and Stripes, and that Stars and Stripes is forced to keep coming back to them as they are now. Tacks are getting shorter and shorter at this stage, so that again may help Kookaburra. You can see there on the screen, that's the margin of the lead approximately. And as Kookaburra's tacks the right-hand side of the screen, she'll head out towards the spectators. You can just see them occasionally dropping into the top of the screen. They're not that far away. There's three spectator fleets here. One goes to the right-hand side of the course you go up in, one on the left, and a small one that goes up the middle of the course. You can see something in the background. Chris? Harold, the, uh, should add that it takes about 35 to 40 seconds to get these 12 metres up to maximum speed after tacking. Uh, they'll go into attack uh, doing the normal boat speed of about, about 8.3 knots around now. This boat speed will drop down to 7.1 or 7.2. Uh, on a bad tack, it might even get down below seven knots. And uh, it takes somewhere between you know, 30, 35, even 40 seconds to get back up to speed again. So when we see Kookaburra or Stars and Stripes go off the right-hand side like that, they'll try to go take the boat just up to maximum speed. They don't really want to go as far that way. And uh, that'll mean 40 seconds off to each side. Well, on with that subject, I think we'd better hear from uh, Peter Eisler uh, aboard Stars and Stripes uh, on the subject of boat speed. As far as the difference in boat speed, it's not the difference between a top fuel dragster and a turbocharged Porsche. There's just inches faster on uh, over five minutes. If you gain 10 feet, you're pretty happy. If you gain 10 yards, you're ecstatic. And that's what uh, Stars and Stripes was able to do against Kiwi Magic. So uh, faster boats are always better. So if somebody says that this boat is faster and somebody says that boat's more maneuverable, 100 sailors out of 100 would rather be on the faster boat. Coming up on the third mark, out on the course with Buddy Melchers and Peter Montgomery. Well, at this stage, the breeze is coming from 200 to 202, so it's still boxing back around a little bit. The breeze is 70 to 18 knots, and there's Kookaburra going for the 17th tack on this beat to windward. They've really been mixing it up. Uh, they've probably done more, well, not probably, they have done more tacks on the speed than they have in any other beat so far, buddy. Well, and that's helping Kookaburra stay uh, close to Dennis. It doesn't let Dennis uh, stretch it out on those long tacks to really get smoking. And uh, right now, here comes Dennis again. He wants very desperately to nail Kookaburra 3 with a, a real hard cover uh, on that last approach to the mark so that he can really zing out a very comfortable lead. So far, he's not been able to get that real hard cover. Kookaburra's been tacking away to the right each time. And I think she's done a very nice job in clearing yourself back to the center of the course gradually, ever gradually, so that Dennis can't put that hard cover. And here he comes with that hard cover, going to force Kookaburra back out to the right one more time. And of course, what Dennis is looking for is to hopefully get the uh, hard cover on that last, oh, maybe three minute tack to the mark that he can actually pick up another 15 seconds, uh, which would amount to about two boat lengths. That's uh, the 19th tack for uh, Dennis Connor. Matching now Kookaburra done 19. They're around three to 400 meters away uh, from the top mark. This will complete leg number three, the beat to windward directly into the eye of the southwesterly breeze, or the Frio Doctor as it's known locally here by the citizens of Perth. And uh, still Stars and Stripes got a comfortable lead now as the breeze is still 17 knots and it's round now to 211, 212. So all the time it's shifting 5, 10, 15 degrees and that's the thing that Harold and Chris and Buddy have been emphasizing. Sports tack here, we can see the approach to the mark. All those tacks up the line with Stars and Stripes, the red boat, cook about the yellow boat was to force Kookaburra to stay the right-hand side of the course. The <coughs> windward marks the bottom left-hand side, so you have to stand in your head and imagine the right-hand side of the course being the one above the line. And it was pushing Kookaburra out there all the time, and they've succeeded in doing that as they lay into the line uh, to this windward mark. 
Coming up on that mark now as we get back to Peter Montgomery. So the breeze still 17 knots from the southwest and uh, still around 200 meters to go for Stars and Stripes through to this top mark. Once they round that, then they'll hoist their spinnakers and answer to the breeze. Uh, there'll be a reach and uh, so the wind will be hitting the boats roughly between the quarter past and 25 past area. So they'll have the spinnaker set uh, just off the bow of the boat on the left hand side in answer to the first reach then they'll round the jibe mark which is the halfway mark in this eight leg race and then take off into the second reach uh, with the spinnaker over on the other side so stars and stripes looking pretty formidable now and uh, really they would have the best part of 30 odd seconds advantage buddy well yes and she's done what we talked about uh, peter she's gotten that hard cover on top of Cooper for a three and that disturbed uh, airflow is affecting Cooper Bar now. And Dennis is probably getting that other 15 seconds onto the lead that we spoke about earlier. This is going to be a very interesting reach, the fourth leg of the course, and uh, see if, in fact, anybody goes to the Jennikers that we heard so much about in the final elimination series with the defenders. And whether or not that uh, course uh, to the, the next mark is tight enough that a Jenniker would be a sensible sail. I would believe that Dennis would go with a standard spinnaker and only the Kookaburra boat would uh, consider something that might close the gap that she so dearly has to do to get in control. The breeze coming from 205, 206 degrees at the moment. It's up to 17 knots as Stars and Stripes is closing now to the top mark and they have uh, a comfortable advantage now going into this fourth leg. They've got their spinnaker pole up, set, ready to go for the reach. Scott Vogel on the bow, who was aboard Liberty in 1983. In fact, uh, there are five crew members aboard who had sailed on Liberty. Tom Whitten, the tactician, John Wright, the starboard tailor, the Kyle Smith, the grinder, and Scott Vogel, the bowman, as they're rounding the mark now. And the clock is starting to tick off against Kookaburra. Also aboard uh, two Liberty Reserves, Adam Ostenfeld and Bill Trenkle, both tailors now aboard Stars and Stripes. And another thing that uh, perhaps we shouldn't overlook is the revenge factor here for this crew in giving the old mug back to where Americans think it belongs in the United States. As Kookaburra now is coming up to the mark, they'll tack across onto starboard. And then up goes the pole, and they'll hoist that off. And so this is a big advantage now on this beat. I must say I'm a little surprised as the time is really starting to tick away. As it stopped at 42 seconds, remember it was 22 seconds at the last mark. So the spinnaker going up now on Kookaburra 3 as they chase stars and stripes. 42 seconds behind, just reviewing the race so far. Five seconds behind at the start, and then 26 seconds behind at the first beat. Kookaburra taking four seconds out on that spinnaker run, but Stars and Stripes on the second beat to windward as the wind has freshened up to 20 knots, have a 42 second advantage going into leg number four. We'll be back after this break.
photography of over the red uh, hood. Yeah. I believe it's right behind that. Three legs completed now on the fourth leg. The first reaching mark out to the wing mark there on this America's Cup course. Coming up, in fact, therefore, on the halfway mark. And you can see the two yacht stars and stripes right of screen. And Kookaburra on the left. Kookaburra tailing out the previous mark. They were 42 seconds behind. And uh, that's not a happy situation to be in. They lost 20 seconds on that leg. And uh, let's find out from Greg Cavill, that bearded man that you see so often in front of race cam. Let's find out from him just what it's like to be behind in this situation. Oh, I think we hope his mainsail falls down or something like that. Um, there's not much you can do. You know, you look up there and see him so far ahead and you've just got to keep working at it and keep the boat going, you know. Hope for a miracle. Hoping for a miracle, and that's, I think, what it's going to take, Peter Montgomery. about that? Because on this... Uh, First reach now, Stars and Stripes have really started to hit the straps as their crew are working hard. It really is a worry now for the Kookaburra 3, 42 seconds behind as the uh, breeze is continuing to freshen throughout the afternoon. It's now 20 knots coming from a direction of 223 degrees. But uh, buddy, this magnificent day out here in a way a little touch of melancholy because uh, all the tourist brochures about Western Australia, about Perth are right. You can see why so many folk uh, who may be on immigrant ships coming from uh, either Britain or Italy or Europe somewhere, when they get off from, from Antle and Perth, you can see why they want to stay. There's not a cloud in the sky. It's uh, 38 degrees in Perth. It's a little cooler out here on the water, around 30 degrees. Magnificent area for sailing. And uh, it would have been nice to come back here in three years. That's assuming New Zealand couldn't have won it, buddy. Well. New Zealand, I don't know, the Southern Hemisphere's got something going for it, all right. No question about that. And I'll tell you, though, I've said it a number of times, and I'll say it again. This has got to be the most fantastic place to sail 12 meters of any place in the world. Gage Roads has impressed me. It's impressed Dennis, I'm sure. He loves every minute of what he's going through out there now. And all the other defenders, challengers, and the likes that have come here. And you know, it was back in 1976, when I was here on a lecture tour that I went across and saw Australia won while she was upside down being plated by Steve Ward and Ben Lexon had his overhauls on working right there with Steve and building the boat that started, really started the Australians on their way to being a, a very formidable contender in America's Cup racing. I'll tell you, right then and there, I had, I heard about Gage Rhodes from uh, at that time, Bobby Miller, who is now known as Ben Lexon. And, of course, he needs no introduction to you Australians, but what he has accomplished out here in the design of 12 meters, he's uh, led the whole world to wing keels and made a breakthrough in 12-meter design that Dennis and the likes of the rest of the Americans thought never would be possible. And here we are sailing now in winds of over 20 knots, consistently with 12 meters and with, they're so positive out here on the race course by that statement i mean that the boats are not falling apart the crews are not being washed overboard uh, these chase boats that are out here following them around were supposed to be here to pick up the crews because they were going to be swimmers out here on gates roads consistently and of course the idea was that those sweet crew members especially from the united states wouldn't be shark bait out here for uh, what I understand is in the Indian Ocean. But uh, on the other hand, it's only uh, a couple of guys that have been washed overboard. 12 meters are great out here on Gates Roads, and we've got to come back. About six to seven minutes to go now to the jibe mark for Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra 3 as they're heading under Spinnaker on the first reach of the triangle to complete leg number four of this fourth race of the America's Cup. Stars and Stripes in front of Kookaburra 3. United States leading Australia as they close to the halfway mark. We'll be back after this break.
almost four legs completed now. Coming up on the halfway mark, the wing mark in this fourth America's Cup race between Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra. There's Stars and Stripes on screen. You might uh, recall a few moments ago we saw a spectator craft uh, upside down and uh, in tow by the harbours and marine. We're happy to report that the five people that were aboard were safely rescued by the harbours and marine department. Now we get back out onto the water with Peter Montgomery who needs no rescuing at all. Not at this stage. Uh, it's really absolutely magnificent out here, the conditions. But Stars and Stripes now just a matter of minutes away from the jibe mark or the wing mark where they'll change direction. They push the spinnaker across to the other side. Jibing means changing direction with the wind behind you. And currently the breeze is coming from 227. So round figures, it's uh, from the southwest or the Fremantle Doctor as it's known here in Perth. And uh, the breeze at the moment is 18, 19 knots. The sea's just getting a little bit lumpier, buddy, uh, as the afternoon goes on. Well, the powerboat's out here watching us. Yeah. What appears to be the final race of the 1987 America's Cup uh, have added to that wave condition for sure. But it's going to take something in the form of a breakdown, a torn sail, to get this race back to uh, reality for Kookaburra 3, Peter. I don't know what they can do uh, with their present concept of just sailing around the race course. They're going to have to cut across. So there are around uh, 800 to 1,000 craft of all shapes and sizes, including some very fancy luxury craft, as the Stars and Stripes crew working hard, Kyle Smith and Jim Cavley, the big grinders, they are around 500 pounds, they're working hard. Uh, Tom Whitten there with the white hat and the red and white striped shirt, here's the... He is the, uh, the tactician aboard as uh, Stars and Stripes getting close to uh, dropping uh, their staysail now. And uh, they've got their spinnaker up, powering down to the mark. They'll be doing around 12 knots at the stage, buddy, as uh, they're coming to the jibe mark. Yes, and this is a very simple maneuver for Dennis. Uh, when they round the mark, they'll simply uh, uh, drop the pole. Uh, through the head stay, here's a great overhead shot to let you see exactly what's taking place. Cole drops through that four triangle, comes back on the new guy on the port side, or the brace as Harold calls it. The spinnaker is on, their, on the uh, new starboard side of the boat for the port tack, uh, reach back to home plate, or uh, the starting mark, the America's Cup buoy. So remember when they went round the top mark the last time, that was the windward mark. They were 42 seconds in front of this yacht, Kookaburra 3, who's still coming down to the mark under Spinnaker, and they're already set to jibe as well. It involves Don McCracken right on the bow, and they've got to feed uh, the pole right across, and they clip that through. There it goes, there it goes, Don McCracken doing it right now, and whoop, oh, goes the uh, main keep your heads down crew as that main boom just crashes across and stops at 49 seconds so there uh, they've taken another seven seconds out and Problems. Kookaburra just struggling a little bit to get their spinnaker under control they've lost the sheet as they're trying to get that back uh, under the control. Sheet's on the spinnaker boys the man just lost it off the drum it takes a minute now sloppy sailing when they made the transition from the brace to the sheet that's the first bit of uh, crew follow-up I've seen out here in quite some time. So they've got it now, so let's look at the race so far as they've passed the halfway mark. Stars and Stripes, brilliant start by Dennis Connor. Got it by five, but also got the psychological advantage and also control by the time they cross for the first time. And then on the first beat to windward, 26 seconds in front. Lost a little to Kookaburra on the downhill slide, but regained it on the third beat to windward, up to 42 seconds, and adding another seven seconds as they went under Spinnaker on the first reach. Now on the second reach, go Going back to the bottom mark to complete the triangle and Kookaburra 3 are doing all they can but it's a pretty difficult task as they're close to a minute behind 49 seconds at that last mark as they're now setting sail down to the bottom mark with spectator craft rimmed all around getting an absolutely magnificent view of Kookaburra 3 chasing this shot stars and stripes that at this stage with half the distance gone look set to take their fourth successive win and so win the America's Cup in the 26th defense. Peter Montgomery there aboard the Kookaburra tender close up to the action and uh, as he said the action seems to be that Dennis Connor and Stars and Stripes are headed to recapture 
the America's Cup. They've had a tough campaign through the summer to come through as the, uh, the challenger for this America's Cup, as of course did Kookaburra, but uh, the question is, and it's been asked before and debated around, uh, who was it harder for, the challenger or the defender, to win through for the right to take place in the Cup final series? We put that question to the main sheet trimmer aboard Stars and Stripes, John Wright. A little bit of everything that adds up, but the fact that we had, I think we had a tougher road to hoe to beat 12 other countries to get here, whereas they only had really one other tough competitor. So I think we've seen a lot of the fire and brimstone, and I think that's going to show plus all the experience that we have in uh, the Cup will come through. Hard work, and uh, I think uh, Chris Dixon, as we've discussed a couple of times, it looks like that uh, the hard work that was uh, involved in winning through the Challenger Series is uh, proving beneficial for Stars and Stripes right here. Most definitely, Gary. All of the challenges uh, were talking for a long time, long before this, uh, the final started that uh, they felt the challengers did have an advantage over the uh, defenders. Looking at the boats that made the semi-finals of the Challenger Series, there were four very radical boats. Stars and Stripes, as we can see, is a very different boat. KZ7, uh, fiberglass, first fiberglass, 12 meter, also a very different boat. USA with the uh, rudder in the bow, rudder in the stern, and uh, really without a keel at all, is the most radical 12 meter ever. And, French Kiss, uh, a year ago when she first appeared for the World Championships in Perth, was also termed the, uh, the most radical boat of the series. So what we had was uh, the four most different boats made it through the semi-finals, pushed each other along very, very hard, and uh, looking at the performance of those top four challenges, and maybe even you know, White Crusader America 2 might have uh, been up there as well, I think those top four or five challenges might have had an edge on the uh, top one or two defenders. So keep in mind, 13 challenges and the competition that they bred amongst themselves have probably, well, obviously, looking at the end product of Stars and Stripes, have reached a higher standard than that uh, that the four defenders could reach. So I don't think it's anyone's individual fault that that has happened, but uh, simple fact of competition, that competition breeds a better standard and that the, uh, the challenges have got that better standard. Well, no sooner is the America's Cup here, Harold Cupmore, than it looks like it might be on its way back to America, just when uh, Fremantle and uh, Perth and Australia, in fact, are getting a real taste for the spectacle of 12-metre yacht racing. Uh, now that we've got the facility here, what, uh, what's going to happen in the future with 12-metre racing? Are we going to see the back, these boats back? Well, you were interesting. You raised the question with yesterday. In fact, the, the class made a statement about this, and what they're doing is they're offering the 1988 World Championships to any venues around the world that uh, choose to, to bid for it. And the bids are really provide the necessary facility, transport, uh, accommodation and travel, that sort of thing. So Fremantle is so well set up that it wouldn't take an enormous effort to bring them back here. And I'm sure Sydney and Melbourne would also look at the possibility of having this wonderful class racing here for perhaps two months in two years' time. But if at that time people are developing boats to sail in an America's Cup, say, off San Diego, and they're developing a different type of boat, will they be prepared to come back with boats that are suited to these conditions? In other words, these boats? I would think what would happen is that if we're going to a lighter weather place like Newport or San Diego, if, if the judgment was it wasn't too extreme, one well, would then probably come back here in something like late April, mm. because the weather conditions will be comfortable. Sure. And I think you would orientate the weather conditions, uh, you're trying to orientate the the, the, the time of year to suit the weather conditions. The important thing is that the class is now establishing a, an attitude to keeping in racing between America's Cups, and Fremantle has been uh, such a wonderful host to, to all this class as when the owners speak together and they're the people that make the decisions, there's a strong sentiment, if the Cup leaves here, which it looks like doing so, to come back here. We've had such a good time here. Keep our fingers crossed for 1988 and maybe the World 12 Metre Championships coming back to Fremantle. On screen you see Stars and Stripes leading Kookaburra halfway down the fifth leg of this fourth race for the America's Cup. We'll be back in a moment. We're on the second reaching leg of this fourth America's Cup race coming up on the fairway boy again when they'll start another beat to Windward. Stars and Stripes leading and leading comfortably 49 seconds round the previous mark over Cookabara 3 and Jeff Merrill, Dennis Connor already 
on his way, well on his way, in fact, to establishing more records in the history books of America's Cup sailing. Yes, he is uh, definitely, Gary. Today, Dennis Connor is appearing in his 16th America's Cup race as helmsman and has skippered more cup finals than any other sailor in the history of the America's Cup. In fact, he passes two men, the J-Bow wizard Harold Vanderbilt, who won the America's Cup three times in the 1930s and was skipper in 14 races, and Sir James Hardy, who has been the helmsman for Australian efforts in 14 races of America's Cup finals. So, That's a pretty impressive, impressive uh, stuff. Yeah, Another sure thing that, uh, that I was able to uncover is that though we don't have full crew lists dating back to the beginning of the America's Cup, Dennis Connor has now sailed in a total of 20 America's Cup races, more than any other sailor in passing Sir Thomas Lipton, who appeared in uh, 18 Cup finals spanning 31 years on Shamrocks 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Oh, Vanderbilt and Lipton, he's put himself up there with the big ones, Harold Cup. Oh. Right, indeed. He just has one more step to go. Vanderbilt uh, was three times winner of the Cup on Enterprise Rainbow and Ranger from 1930, 34 through 37. Well, I would guess that Connor would like to win it three times without having to uh, lose it in between. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was on 74, but he wasn't skip on the starting home. But uh, Va Vanderbilt, in fact, uh, invented modern yachting in some ways with the starts and the rules and everything else. And the link to today is not that tenuous because one of his crew was Alden Stevens. And Alden Stevens is still alive and was advisor on the America 2 program for the New York Yacht Club. So spanning 50 years, it's a tremendous span of time, really, to be currently active in this place. Well, and in addition to, uh, to his influence on modern sailing, he invented the game of contract bridge, which has kept people on shore and on boats busy for numbers of hours in the last 40, 50 years. He has a lot to answer for. <laughs> it's interesting, those J-boats were five times bigger than these 12-meter yachts. Getting ready to put the uh, headsail up on uh, Stars and Stripes on its way up, as you can see. So they're coming up on the mark very shortly. You see the Spectator fleet, some of those magnificent craft in the background. Outside of the ocean liners, the big motor yachts, absolutely superb. Stars and Stripes really making uh, every post a winner now, Chris. Certainly are, Gary. The uh, nice conservative heads will hoist again there. And uh, we'll wait and see what the times are. But having put a few more seconds on Kookaburra on that first reach, it uh, wouldn't surprise me if perhaps they've done the same again now. But even if Kookaburra can close the gap a fraction, Stars and Stripes has consistently got that 15 or 20 second advantage upwind. And unless she has a major problem or a major breakdown, Kookaburra just isn't going to get that break that she so badly needs. There's the mark, as you can see. Fifth mark. Stars and Stripes powering along. 20 knots, southwest breeze, and on every leg, bar the second, just opening it out a little bit more each time. Let's get out onto the water now as they come up on the mark with Peter Montgomery and Buddy Melgers. They're about two boat lengths away from the Lewis mark, and uh, Dennis is about ready to blow his halyard away. His spinnaker is breaking. There goes the halyard, and now they've got to put it away smartly. They can't catch any fish. If they do catch fish, they'll stop, but they've Got it under control, and the last of the spinnaker is going down in the sewer. Dennis rounds up for the third windward leg now. The part of the race course that Dennis really thrives on. Of course, I'm not too sure he doesn't thrive on all the legs, whether it be with the wind, across the wind, or certainly into the wind. And now approaching the mark, the fairway buoy, the American Cup buoy is Kookaburra three. The jib is up. Everything is in position, and you'll know on this takedown, or you'll notice on this takedown, that Kookaburra 3 will blow the tack clean on her spinnaker pole, and it really makes for a bit of a smoother takedown. And she's carrying that spinnaker right up to the mark, and it goes just to blow away like I suggested, and it makes for a cleaner takedown. Very nice work by uh, the boys on Kookaburra 3, and it looks like they've actually pulled out a couple of seconds on that past reach, Peter. They've called, pulled out one second only. They were 49 seconds behind at the jibe mark or the wing mark, the halfway mark. Now one leg further on, that's rounding leg number five, going into the third beat to windward or the sixth leg of the race. Kookaburra three is trailing stars and stripes by 48 seconds. The breeze is 19 knots, so it's still holding pretty steady at this stage. And uh, as we check now, it is coming from 
197, as I say, 196. So the breezes move around 20 odd degrees down to 190, uh, 196, 197, 19 knots. And uh, really, that it looks, buddy, a pretty formidable task now. Pretty academic, really, isn't it? As much as uh, I hate saying it. It certainly looks that way, Peter, out here on Gage Road. The wind is up. It's Dennis Connors' conditions right to the letter now. And back to you, Gary. Thank you, buddy. Let's uh, recap the marks here. The start went to Stars and Stripes by five seconds, and she continued to lead 26 seconds around the first. Kookaburra made up some ground. It was 22 seconds at the uh, second mark. The third mark, however, the second beat to Winwood. Stars and Stripes really powered out to a 42-second lead, extended it to 49 seconds at the end of the first reach, and Kookaburra has pulled back that bare one second. So rounding the fifth mark, end of the second reach, Stars and Stripes continue to lead 48 seconds, and viewers in New South Wales leave us at this stage for news commitments. On screen, Stars and Stripes, left of screen, Kookaburra on the right as we go back to Peter Montgomery. Well, they're working their way up to the beat to Windward now. And, buddy, I, I think uh, it would be interesting to hear from you about the comments Harold was making about how good the host here in Perth and from Antelope being the Royal Perth Yacht Club, the Royal Freshwater Yacht Club with uh, the Louis Vuitton Challenger Series. Uh, they've run an awful lot of races here, uh, 358 that they've run so far. Do you think the shape of the America's Cup will be changed forever? by getting it away from the New York Yacht Club and the cloistered little group there and the spectacular shots we're seeing, not only the television shots, but just the whole organization. Well, so many things are taking place because uh, of the loss to Australia in 1983 by the New York Yacht Club. And what I see uh, is, for the first time, an opportunity of another club in North America to challenge for the America's Cup and the possibility of bringing it to a new area of the North American continent. It looks like Dennis is on his way, uh, bringing the cup up to San Diego and Southern California. A great light weather area, as Harold said. So it will take uh, a case of a complete redesign to the 12 meter. And maybe Australia too will be brought back out of mothballs. And these boats that you see out on Gage Roads uh, this year will be put away uh, for safekeeping to either go to Hawaii if the situation arises or the hope of coming back to Fremantle and sailing out here on Gage Roads. You know, as far as Dennis is concerned, the one thing that I think was so very, very important was the fact that his people uh, never gave up the strive to become faster on the race course. Uh, and faster on the race course, they had to come with sail shape. They uh, modified their boat. They put the uh, 3M uh, uh, ripplets on the, on the hull. And all of a sudden, the, the pie was made. It was in the oven cooking. And what has he done out here on the race course now but uh, showed the rest of the world what a chef he is when it comes to driving a 12 meter. He is absolutely fantastic. He knows how to carve those little pieces of real estate out of a, well, in this case, the outback, out from under uh, Peter uh, Gilmore right at the start. And when Peter looked like he had the complete control, the push and shove of stars and stripes, all of a sudden, Dennis whips another arrow out of his quiver and shoots down the bird from out of the sky. So there we have Kookaburra now on port. The distance is growing all the time, 48 seconds at the last mark. I think we can look forward to stars and stripes with an advantage over a minute because once a boat gets out this far in front that they can control the race, sail on the lifts when it suits them. Buddy, your comments and reaction to the way this regatta has been run by Royal Perth Yacht Club, the Louis Vuitton Challenger Series. Uh, this is the 366th race out here. Uh, it's just an enormous number of races they had to run for the Challengers and also for the Defenders. And there's never, ever been even the slightest query by any uh, participant in all of these races that they would consider uh, protesting the race committee for their uh, activities out here on Gage Roads. I'll tell you though, what probably makes it 
and makes the committees look so good is virtually the Fremantle doctor. He is a surgeon when it comes to making the wind blow at 207 degrees day after day after day. There's only one other place where I heard about that particular wind direction being so accurate, and that was on a mountain lake in Mexico when they had the Pan American Games. The race committee actually left the committee boat moored on station, the other end of the starting line set up, and they would just simply ferry the committee back and forth to the race committee boat. I'm not too sure they couldn't do that out here on Gates Roads, but one of those uh, reasons why, of course, is that steady wind, reason why the race committee work has been so perfect, letter perfect, and of course, you know, it, it takes a lot more than just that. It takes the people, uh, the cooperation of everyone, the knowledge of of uh, Mother Nature by the committee. These guys are all past sailors in their own right, accomplished, I'm sure, and those that people that uh, contribute to sitting on a boat out here and spending uh, what might be their entire vacation time, uh, just, it, it's a great contribution, but it shows the rest of the world what this great game of yachting can really mean uh, out here on Gage Road. It's fantastic. Certainly, no doubt about it, that the shape of the America's Cup and probably yachting as a sport would have been changed because of what has happened here in the last five months as this man Dennis Connor and his ten other talented crew members have tacked across on the port as they're closing to halfway up this beat to windward as Kookaburra is moving across back on to starboard to try and challenge them but at this stage Stars and Stripes will be moving out to a minute's advantage on this the sixth beat uh, sixth leg of the race the third beat to windward we'll be back after this break. Five legs of this race completed, just over two and a half to go at this stage as the yachts beat to windward. Kookaburra on screen, tailed around the previous mark by 48 seconds. Dennis Connor really serving it up once more. 
contrary to the uh, form that we saw displayed in the very early stages of the regatta when it, uh, it looked at one stage as though Stars and Stripes was going to struggle to make the uh, Challenger semi-finals and finals, but make it they did, win the right to challenge they did, and serving it up they are now to Kookaburra. Raises an interesting question, not the first time it's been raised around the waterfront here in the last several weeks, have they been sandbagging? Were they really uh, trying or were they taking it easy earlier on? That's a question that we put to the tactician aboard Stars and Stripes, Tom Whitten. We worked very hard on trying to make the early round robins not too mentally taxing from the standpoint that we felt that it was only important to be in the top four. We felt like we could achieve our goal if we were just one of the top four, and we really frankly didn't think that if we finished first it mattered all that much. So to peak mentally, we took a lot of the pressure off the people that would have otherwise felt pressure to do well in the early parts. Well, if they were ever kidding, they certainly had everybody fooled, Harold. I think they developed their boat certainly during the summer. And they came in in the lighter weather, perhaps they weren't quite right, and they took a walk. They used the area round robins to reposition their boat. But by the third round robin, they were in pretty good shape. They tweaked it for the semi final and final of the Louis Vuitton Cup. And I think they came into this regatta in pretty good shape. Chris, were you as confident as uh, Kookaburra obviously were of, of a, at least, you know, winning? two, maybe three races against Stars and Stripes? I mean, did you really believe going into that uh, Challenger final series that you could match it with them? We, uh, I wouldn't say we're confident of winning two or three against them, Gary, because uh, we were very determined and very confident of going out and winning four against them. <laughs> uh, we certainly, as the Kookaburra, as Ian Murray and co, uh, we certainly didn't go out there to lose races. And it was a little bit distressing to actually go out and find that Stars and Stripes did have the measure of us. And uh, exactly when that turnaround came was, uh, we all know is somewhere between the third round robin and the semi-finals. But uh, no, I'm sure they were never sandbagging, but earlier in the year, I think they had a very good boat that uh, maybe they weren't sailing quite as well as they are now. The crew work certainly wasn't up to the standard it is now. The sail inventory has uh, come ahead leaps and bounds since October and November. So I think earlier in the year, they weren't the, uh, the race-winning boats that uh, we're seeing out there now, and they have progressed steadily throughout the year. They did actually start off a little bit behind a number of the other challenges, and uh, hence uh, we saw them losing a lot of races in November especially. So they're a boat that started behind, always a good boat, but they have learned to sail it very, very well. Their crew work is right up there, the sail inventory is right up there, and uh, looks like they're still going ahead. So I think a number of the other challenges started off ahead, but just couldn't keep going at the same pace that they have. So sure, a little bit, a little bit distressing to go out, as Ian Murray has, knowing you've got a fast boat, good program, expecting to do well, expecting to, to win four races, even if it's 4-2 or 4-3, and finding out that, in fact, uh, after two and a half years, you don't have the boat speed you need to have. In fact, the other boat has got an edge on you, and you're going to be lucky to, uh, or struggling, to take even one or two races off them. Halfway down, this uh, sixth leg of the race, Stars and Stripes, continues to lead comfortably. My, it's amazing how fortunes change, isn't it? 1983, the world fell apart for Dennis Connor. Things just went absolutely wrong for him. Harold Cudmore, where have things gone wrong uh, for Australia this time? Well, let's start where things went wrong for Dennis in 1983. He won the Cup in 1980. He had upped the game. He had two boats. He sailed an enormous amount of time, several years. He, he redefined America's Cup sailing in 1980. At that stage, Alan Bond and his crew, they looked at what it would take to win, and Alan realized, more clearly than anybody else, he would have to go for a design breakthrough. That Australia didn't have the resource at that stage to meet Dennis Connor nose to nose in terms of crews and all the other things they required. So he gambled on a, a, an adventurous boat, Australia too, and in fact, in the process of doing that, they brought most of the other areas together because with John Bertrand and Tom Snackenberg, and the rest of the team, they upped their act in rigs and sails to a very high level. And they produced, to Dennis really, a fait accompli. Mm -hmm. It was too late for him to react to us. He didn't identify the seriousness of the threat. Now, the interesting thing is, and, uh, and this is a compliment to Dennis, is when he was faced with defeat, and with his thoroughness, and when he looked at this blank sheet of paper and what it would take to win the cup, and he put together this program, the people who had won the cup, Alan Bond and his group, did not make the same decision. They did not approach it quite the same way. They didn't look at a blank sheet, a sheet of paper. What they said is, ah, oh, we've got the top boat, we'll develop this boat and we'll stay on top. 
Now, this influenced the Kookaburra program. Kookaburra had the biggest budget here. They spent something in the order of 28 million Australian dollars. They put the most time, the most effort. They did what Dennis Connor did in the 70s. They, they sort of threw mega bucks at it. But what they didn't do was start in the correct design premise. They didn't go back to original thinking. They again evolved from existing boats, and in this they were influenced by, I presume, the Alan Bond approach. So the whole defense, excluding steak and kidney, which came from the game slightly separately, was premised falsely. They really didn't go back to original thinking and identify the requirements of defending and produce a completely valid defense and then build with the enormous budget, something like 50 to 60 million dollars in total that was put into it by Australia and build a competitive boat. But Dennis is the person that did, did this. Now we, for instance, in White Crusader, we made the same mistake as Alan Bond and the Kookaburras. We took a good boat, Victory 83, we took the same people and we developed from that. We also took a radical shot that wasn't successful. So we ended up somewhat in a similar situation to Kookaburra. America, too, went along a very similar line, whereas Chris Dixon and his group on New Zealand, they went back to original thinking. They got a group of very experienced, successful designers around the world, and they produced a first shot, a better boat than the people who've been at a long time, like Ben Lexon, and Ian Howlett, Johan Valentin. Uh, Tom Blackall or identifying what Alan Bond did in 1983, went for a radical shot, very good effort, perhaps, perhaps the third, second, third fastest boat out here. The times against Stars and Stripes are not that dissimilar to what they were against New Zealand. Very exciting progress. But the thoroughness of Dennis Connors, the knowledge, the expertise, gave him the edge and the challenges. The lack of sort of clear thinking meant the Australian defense really wasn't quite in the game. All right, well, I think uh, another man who's had an awful lot of input into the success of Stars and Stripes in this campaign, and of course there were many, many people, as Dennis Connor has, has said himself, involved in their whole team approach, but one of them with uh, special input was co-designer Dave Pedrick. Let's hear what he's got to say about this boat. Very little of it should be hit and miss. Um, the technology to evaluate ideas um, can reach a very refined level, and I think we've done that successfully with Stars and Stripes. Um, the ideas still have to come from people, so the creative elements of uh, design still have to come from human beings and uh, a very talented group of human, human beings at that, and our, our Sail America design team has had very diverse people. The, the three yacht designers have uh, rather different design philosophies uh, among ourselves. And the aerospace and ship research consultants had uh, very refreshing uh, thoughts to uh, to try out. So I think that the uh, the brain pool uh, is where things have to start. The analytical side um, is something that we work very hard to develop and refine. And we came up with computer tools that we felt were highly reliable. And um, when it came time for us to make a, a rather dramatic change in our winglets. Um, it's not as dramatic as other people did, but uh, when you're going so well but you feel you really need to do something a little bit better, you uh, do run the risk of a reversal. And our, uh, our computer research and our tank testing research and uh, all getting our heads together um, uh, made us believe that we were doing the right thing. And, and it's a good thing we did, because I don't think we'd be here winning the America's Cup if we hadn't taken that step. Dave Pedrick, co-designer, Stars and Stripes. That's Kookaburra in the foreground, Stars and Stripes in the background. The angle, of course, is very decept deceptive because Stars and Stripes, in fact, is in front. And that gives you a better idea. Well in front, Stars and Stripes, as they come up the uh, sixth leg of this course on the third beat to Winwood, fourth race of the America's Cup final series. We'll be back in a moment.
We're two thirds of the way up this sixth leg of the course, the third beat to Windward, about uh, eight minutes or so to uh, the next mark. Stars and Stripes leading the margin around the previous mark was 48 seconds over uh, Kookaburra. Three races to zero is the score in favour of Dennis Connor and the way things are shaping uh, the America's Cup. As Buddy Melgers would say, looks like it's going back up to the United States. You can see the uh, shadow there is not a very large shark below the surface. It's the uh, blimp about uh, 500 feet above the surface casting its uh, shadow as uh, Dennis Connor powers along there on the left of screen chasing further records in the America's Cup uh, history books. Jeff Merrill, who is the winningest skipper in America's Cup history? Well, actually, uh, Harold Vanderbilt, the 1930s j -Bow master, defended the Cup three times, won the uh, won 12 races and lost two. Little known Charles Barr, though, uh, a three-time America's Cup winner also, was 9-0 uh, and at the turn of the century, 1899 with Columbia, 1901 again with Columbia, and in 1903 with Reliance. You might be uh, curious to know which American helmsman has the worst win-loss record. Do you know, Gary? No, man? no, I'm sure I don't. Well, I'll give you a hint. After race three, his record as a full-time skipper was 10-5, and five, and today he could become 11-5. and five. Dennis Conner actually has lost more races you as an American. It. But uh, obviously that's not going to bother too many people on board Betsy and the Stars and Stripes group as he goes for his fourth Gunsmoke Blue Bullet today. Well, aside from their win loss records, which are, are quite different, uh, Harold Vanderbilt and Dennis Connor do have some things in common or some similarities, Harold. Well, we've mentioned earlier the thoroughness of Dennis Connors and his psychology of, of competition, really. It's interesting to hear the story of Harold Vanderbilt, who is known as Mike Vanderbilt. But the story is that um, changing a J-boat mainsail as the boats are five times bigger than a 12 meter and the sails were correspondingly much heavier because of the type of materials used in those days. The mainsails actually weighed one ton. Well, there was a great tendency to use the mainsail that's already on the boat. So he was forced his crew in the evening after racing to take that mainsail off the boat and take it ashore so that the following morning they would decide the correct means and not to decide to use the one already on the boat. Because that was easiest. Doesn't that give you some idea of the guy we have out here? <laughs> Fifty years ago, Mike Vanderbilt defended the cup successfully for the United States against the challenge from England from Tommy Sobbett. Kookaburra going about. Interesting, uh, interesting note on those sail weights there, Harold, compared to what the, the weights of sails are today. The, the main sail on the back of Kookaburra, All Stars and Stripes, uh, those sails weigh somewhere in the region of 85 to 95 kilos. The uh, Genoa's are around 60 to 65 kilos, and uh, the spinnakers that we see uh, when the boats are going downwind weigh in the region of 20 to 22 kilos, depending on uh, just which cloth weight they're using. So obviously weights have come down a lot in the uh, hundred or so years of the racing that's been going on in modern 12s. That's about, what, one-twelfth or something. The boats were... Uh, 12 meters, one-fifth the size of a J-boat. The mainsail is one-twelfth the weight. Gives you some feeling for the size of boats they used to race. That's progress. Obviously, very important to keep the weight out of the rig and out of the sails as much as possible. You see Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra there leaning over in the reach of 28 to 30 degrees and uh, any weight at the top of the rig makes the boat fall over a little further, slows the boat down. Approaching the sixth mark on this America's Cup course, we'll be back after this break.
It's 16 knots and coming from a direction of 200 degrees as Stars and Stripes has just gone across onto starboard within 100 meters or so of the top mark. And this will complete now leg number six or the third beat to windward. And it does appear on this beat as though they've been able to move away from Kookaburra. There was an advantage at the end of leg number five, the second reach of 48 seconds. It may be, probably be a little bit more than that now, buddy. Yes, it looks that way, Peter. Again, Dennis has just put the pedal down and he has gone out in front. He's at least a minute ahead, possibly a minute and 15 seconds. And he's sailing off to uh, America's Cup win. He's making history. And I just wonder uh, what's going through Dennis's mind right now and the boys on the boat. They gotta be careful to make every move a positive move and uh, don't get over jumpy about setting sails, screwing up here, uh, oh, we're having a drive set, and here we go. That was a good one too, buddy. It was really splendid crew work there by the whole of the crew, not only the four-deck crew of Scott Vogel on the bow, John Barnett on the sewer, and Jay Brown at the mast, but uh, the rest of the crew, Kyle Smith, Jim Cavley, the Bill Trinkle, Adam Ostenfeld, John Wright, all excellent stuff, and no doubt the crew back in the afterguard, Dennis Connors, Peter Eisler, and, and Tom Wooden will be pleased with that. Now, remember when they rounded the last mark, that is leg number five, they were 48 seconds in front and yes they have taken time out of them already as kookaburra still has some distance to come up to the mark the breeze now still coming from the southwest it's around 16 17 knots it's been pretty steady for the rest of the afternoon now the stars and stripes has headed off under Spinnaker on the second last leg of the course the square run a similar point of sailing to the leg number two and they've stopped at one minute and 11 seconds so stars and stripes now has taken another 23 seconds out on that last beat the third beat to windward as they head off under spinnaker pretty tough stuff for kookaburra that's On board Stars and Stripes, on board Kookaburra rather, uh, in pursuit of Stars and Stripes, but I'm afraid it's uh, been Stars and Stripes and Dennis Connor all the way from the start of this race. They won the start by five seconds, rounded the first mark 26 seconds ahead. Kookaburra grabbed back just a few seconds on the first downwind run. It was 22 seconds there at the second mark, then 42 seconds with Stars and Stripes powering away on the second beat to Winwood. 49 seconds at the fourth mark, 48 at the fifth and now out to one minute and 11 seconds rounding the sixth mark. Just two legs of this race to go. Victorian viewers leaving us at this point to fulfill their news commitments. Surfing along, although the, the breeze, uh, is it my mind, seems to have dropped off a little. Well, it's, a, it's an indicator they have the America 2 spinnaker. These are the spinnakers brought on from the other American syndicates who are retired from the Challenger series, and they offer their help to Stars and Stripes. Stars and Stripes didn't need much help, but the one area she did take it was spinnakers. And we gather it's mostly the lighter air spinnakers. You can tell them from the different colors is the red and blue cross stripes. So if, if they've used those, it means they've gone down in size from their maximum spinnakers. That's probably something like uh, 46, uh, 48 foot spinning or something like that. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, that uh, certainly is a little bit smaller, maybe even a little bit lighter than the spinnaker they used in the last downwind leg, Harold. And uh, for whatever reason, they do favor those America 2 spinnakers in the lighter air, and which does indicate the wind has dropped somewhat. It's interesting uh, looking back at some of those leg times uh, on the difference between the boats upwind that Stars and Stripes has been very, very consistent today. She was something like 20 seconds quicker on the first beat, about 21 seconds on the uh, on the next beat, and I think the last one was something like 23 seconds. So she's just steadily moving away, and there's not a lot that Kookaburra can do about it. So interesting also that Stars and Stripes did a jibe set at that top mark, Harold, and uh, went off to the left-hand side of the track, which is the first time we've seen her do that for a, for a little while now. And 
What it means is that uh, it's the last run of uh, what Dennis Connor would like to think is his last America's Cup race for this Ameri for, the, for 1987. Jiving back onto port now to keep a, a reasonably tight cover on Kookaburra. Maybe he's thinking back uh, three or four years to the, uh, the fate that happened on that last downward leg last time round, and he's making sure that it doesn't happen to him this time by covering the left-hand side. He's guaranteed of, in the worst case, if Kookaburra took a, a minute 10 out of him, at least he's still got the left-hand side to be inside on the bottom mark, that last critical mark rounding. And uh, there's only one way that would happen if that's, uh, that's if some disaster struck. But now that they're coming back down this, heading the same way as Kookaburra, they're gonna get the same puffs that come down the course, the same type of breeze that Kookaburra gets. And uh, by doing that, they're guaranteeing that the distance between the boats is gonna stay roughly the same. So they're not into taking any risks right now, and I'm sure there's some pulse rates starting to increase on board Stars and Stripes. Second last leg of the race, of what uh, is looming to be the last race of this series. Just one more win needed for Stars and Stripes to take the cup back to the United States and not an awful lot that Kookaburra can do about it, just outgunned when it comes to boat speed, as has been proved. You must beg the question of the wisdom of the Australian boats uh, trialling in isolation. That re uh, requires enormous confidence in the speed ability, which has been misplaced. Perhaps they would have been better advised to have trialled against the challengers and maintained touch with the challengers through the long summer. Australia 4 certainly came out, and I think Australia 4 began to realize quite early on that there was a major problem for themselves and by implication for the channel, for the defenders. The defenders sailed very close. Some of the racing was the closest here, with Australia 4 and the Kookaburras sailing within seconds of each other until the final of the defense trials. At that stage, Kookaburra jumped ahead, but in fact, Australia 4 was well off the pace against any challenger they met. We raced against them several times. We beat them easily. We realized some two months ago the defense had problems. It's been difficult for me out here with you all the time trying to say, well, hang on a second. I think perhaps Stars and Stripes is looking tough. It has transpired. I'm delighted for Dennis, but I'm very sad because we'd love to have stayed here in Perth and sailed in this beautiful town and wonderful waters off or should I say Fremantle, we say the broadly Western Australia. We've had a great time here. People have been so friendly. I'm not sure any of us could promise our home countries would be as friendly as the reception we've had here. Is that what you found, Chris, too? Most definitely, Harold. I think all of the teams here feel the same way, that they have been very, very well look looked after. And uh, had Kookaburra been able to be successful here this week, uh, I think we'd have all been more than happy to come back, not for one or two years this time, but for even three or four years. But anyway, Stars and Stripes, halfway down the, uh, the last flat run of this race and looking quite comfortable, I think. OK, let's get out onto the water with Peter Montgomery and Buddy Melgers. Well, can I hold my hand up and also say I'd like to have come back here in three years' time. Uh, it's just been absolutely magnificent. And certainly the cappuccino bars, uh, Papa Luigi's and Gino's around for Mantle, I'm sure all of us all miss that. Well, Chris Totter with me has been involved with the Task Force Syndicate or the Kookaburra Syndicate uh, right from the early days. And we must emphasize, of course, although Kookaburra is getting beaten and looks desperate to go down 4-0 against Stars and Stripes, what a marvelous effort they have done as a first-up syndicate, as indeed also, permit me to say, New Zealand did as well. And Chris, your involvement as an electrical engineer from the University of Michigan, I think it is. Uh, you were heavily involved in doing some things that have been really a breakthrough in 12 metres that will still be of good use for you folk in 1990, 1991. Well, I think so. Uh, we went down a development path in several areas uh, in instrumentation and software and computer hardware, design analysis uh, and sale analysis. Uh, some of the things uh, we uncovered uh, we would like to proceed much further into and I think in fact, we're already starting now uh, for 1990. Chris, uh, perhaps you can explain to us as much as you're able to, uh, even though uh, the regatta's over, you may want to still keep some of uh, your secrets, but on board Kookaburra, there is a readout, isn't there, that allows the, uh, the, the, the sailors to be able to trim the sails related to an optimum shape, something you've done in the computer? I mean, someone told me that uh, you folk have discarded with uh, computer assistance uh, what other people haven't even thought of. <laughs> well, I, uh, I 
take that as a compliment to some to some degree. Uh, we did develop a, a sale analysis system, which I think was uh, ahead of its time, and uh, I think we'll see a lot more systems or similar uh, systems developing. We'd like to go further with that as well. And, and in principle, as I said earlier, the, the system was designed to allow real-time uh, comparison of the existing sail shapes with target sail shapes. Uh, we, everyone uses targets to some extent, uh, target boat speed, target angles. Uh, we develop target sail shapes based on the statistical analysis of the boat performance uh, it correlated with the sail shapes that we had. And those we uh, smoothed and developed into targets, which we were able to compare in real time with existing shapes. Uh, and I think uh, there's a potential there is quite uh, enormous for improving sail uh, development as well as sail trim. Now, we made the comment, Buddy and I chatting before, if you haven't got any socks, you can't pull them up. So if Kookaburra is doing 8.3 and Stars and Stripes is doing 8.5 in hull shape, uh, related that your sails are good, your crew works good, and it all comes back to the original design. Do you think there's also the potential that you, the path you've gone for developing a good hull shape as well? Well, I, I think we probably uh, are seeing here the, the results of uh, going down a different design path, and uh, we feel we're fairly highly optimized, uh, and we've built a match racing boat that's uh, well optimized in its design path, possibly uh, as Harold said, we are somewhat in isolation, and uh, the uh, speed machine uh, would have been a better path to follow. And we we expected the racing to be closer, and uh, the tactical machine that we developed was probably uh, would have been advantageous in those conditions. But we can't compete with uh, superior this much superior speed. Chris Totter, uh, one of the really talented engineers, dare I say intellectuals, involved with the Task Force Syndicate. So as you can see, although they're being beaten out on Gage Roads today, they certainly haven't given up for the future. We'll be back after this break. On board Stars and Stripes, these are the guys that are in the winning position with six legs completed, over six and a half. In fact, uh, on the second last leg of the course, coming downwind and rounding the fairway boy, they'll have one more beat to windward up to the finish. And that would mean, if the positions remain unchanged, the America's Cup. Dennis Connor at the helm of Stars and Stripes. Peter Eisler there, Tom Whitten. Jim Kavler and Kyle Smith, the guys there left and right on the grinders. 
And uh, these guys have absolutely done a magnificent job, Harold Cudmore. Really have. They have combined experience, skill, long-range planning, and very good campaigning. And here we see it, very relaxed. There's been a little wisecracking going on. You can just hear the soundtrack. You can pick it up occasionally. Dennis is an expensive human. He hasn't always been that, as we well know. He's taken the odd bite off a kiwi or two, hasn't he, Chris? <laughs> Thank you for that, but Harold, but uh, no, they're going to be starting to be quite an excited crew about now. They'll uh, be looking ahead at, uh, they'll be seeing a finish line on the distance up there, knowing it's about 35 minutes away. All they've got to do is hang in there till the end. They'll be checking every shackle, every pin, just trying to make sure that the rig stays in the boat, the mainsail doesn't fall down. So that's the only thing that's going to take this America's Cup off them now, and there's no way they'll be wanting to let it happen. They'll be doing everything, everything they can to make sure it doesn't happen. So. Starting to get a, a bit excited on board, I would think. Dennis Connor certainly is going to be smiling from here to the finish line. And uh, remember, the opera's never over till the fat lady sings, and they'll be looking forward to that. They'll be looking forward to that finish game. What's the expression? The greatest comeback since Lazarus, is it? Spinnaker flying, stars and stripes is flying. Just a leg and a half to go to clinch the America's Cup. We're going to Ian Hislop right now in San Diego to get the reaction over there. Well, hello, Gary. I heard that thing. It's not over until the fat lady sings. Well, I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people here that believe the fat lady has sung, and that's the end of it all. They have most definitely smelt blood, and uh, they're here in their hundreds. We're talking about a crowd of more than 800 here. They've been watching at every leg, every leg that Dennis Connor goes ahead. There's been a massive roar going up, and I can tell you now that they are very confident that their man is uh, going to get in there and do it at the end. As you can hear now, one of the bigger, bigger roars. Every time he goes past another leg and those seconds tick by, they just go crazy. I'll tell you what, towards the end of the night, uh, they've got no doubt that there's going to be 134 ounces of Britannia silver that'll be coming back to San Diego. We'll come back to you a bit later on, Gary. Thank you very much, Ian Hislop there at the San Diego Yacht Club with the joyous crowds, the people that have backed Dennis Connor in this campaign and what certainly looks like being a successful campaign. We're going back out on the water now to the Kookaburra Tender and to Peter Montgomery and Buddy Melgers. The breeze is still around 18, 19 knots. It's coming back from 218 degrees at the moment. And there's about five or 600 meters to go for Stars and Stripes under Spinnaker to complete the last spinnaker run they'll do out here on Gage Roads in 47 races. And once they round that, they have three and a quarter nautical miles directly into the eye of this Fremantle doctor that's at 18, 19 degrees at the moment. And boy, won't that blood be pumping. No question about that. Dennis's uh, boys are pretty excited right now. I imagine they're counting uh, the moments left in this uh, great effort that they've put together two and a half years. And uh, they got about 40 minutes more of sailing, a little bit less. And uh, the cup, it looks like it's in their hip pocket. So Kookaburra now with their green and yellow and white spinnaker flying, set an answer to the Frio Doctor, but they're just too far back. It doesn't look as though they've been able to take any time out on that uh, downhill slide or any appreciable distance anyway. It'll still be at least uh, 60 seconds behind as they go into the final leg of the race, and that's really too far back to be able to attack and uh, attack and really take it to uh, Stars and Stripes. So now they've still got about 400 metres to go down on the downhill slide, and then the final beat to windward. So we must still applaud and remember this crew here who have done so well. It's uh, Greg Cavill right up front, and there is... Uh, Rick Goodrich with the bandana around his uh, head, one of the big grinders, right back half. Derek Clark just putting his hat on back. He is the tactician. That's Ian Burns with the red hat grinding there on the main sheet with Peter Grillmore. So they're still working hard, and this crew has done a marvellous job, a bit like the uh, New Zealanders aboard KZ-7. They never gave up at any stage, but on a slower boat, it's pretty hard to be able to keep up with the flying Dennis Connor. At this page, a special welcome back to viewers in New Zealand with Stars and Stripes, US 55, Gunslope Blue, coming down to the bottom mark. They've got around 300 metres to go before they drop their spinnaker for the last time out on Gage Roads this long, hot summer. 
and they're uh, jibing across right now as they're heading to the mark. It's a hot day here in Perth, 38 degrees in downtown Perth, still over 30 degrees out on the water, although the cooling from Antle Docker has made life a little more bearable out here, a magnificent West Australian day, not a cloud in the sky, over a thousand spectator craft of all shapes and sizes, including six big passenger liners and some magnificent private motor yachts as well, watching the climax to this 1987 America's Cup as Dennis Connor and his talented crew look as though they're going to go 4-0 and take the cup back to where they think it belongs. Do you think it belongs there? Well, I'm not too sure that I'd like to see it in San Diego, Peter. It'll look really great in fresh water in downtown Chicago, as far as I'm concerned. But it is coming up, and we're very happy about that as an American. You can believe it. And, uh, you know, we've got a lot of friends down here in the Southern Hemisphere. I wonder how Fraser and Sue are getting along over there in Auckland right now. But there's a jib going up on Stars and Stripe. They're about one minute and 10 seconds away from the mark. Uh, to round on the last time that Dennis Conner will be going around the America's Cup buoy here in 1987. He sailed magnificently all the way through, even in spite of his dog days in November when he had no speed, supposedly a dog boat. Many people thought he had overbuilt for the conditions here that he could have had a smaller boat. And I think all he did was stuff it right in their nose with a, a boat that so loves this chop out here on Gage Road. There's a lot of people that criticized he shouldn't have worked up in Hawaii, a lot of people who criticized him for him rushing back, be it fundraising trips or looking after his business in San Diego. Uh, certainly, Dennis Conn has been under a lot of criticism in the spotlight here throughout the summer, but in fact, he has really proved them wrong. So, Scott Vogel up on the bow, right back after you can see Dennis Connor with the red hat on, Tom Whitten, the tactician with the white hat on and the red and white uh, shirt as they're coming down to the mark. The port grinder is Kyle Smith having his second race. He's been alternating with Henry Childers. Uh, Jim Cavley, the starboard grinder, has been out all the time as they drop the spinnaker. They've shot the haggard, and now the spinnaker will be coming in and then uh, they've rounded, hardened on the breeze and around the fairway boy or the America's Cup boy for the last time this summer as Stars and Stripes is heading into the Fremantle Doctor or the southwesterly of 16, 17 knots. The sea getting a little lumpier throughout the afternoon. The last mark they rounded, that was mark number six at the end of the third beat to windward. They were one minute and 11 seconds in front of Kookaburra. Now they're on the eighth and final leg. This is the fourth and final beat to windward. Kookaburra still coming down to the mark. They've been trying hard. There's Ian Burns down below in race cam below decks, waiting ready to grab the spinnaker. It's been pretty dry there today. In fact, only one of the races, the second race, has it been pretty rugged and tough down below like a rainforest. So there goes the spinnaker now for Kookaburra. Ping it goes, and there's Ian Burns pulling as hard as he can, still hasn't given up. And the crew on deck, about two or three of them, are really pulling in on that spinnaker as well and trying to stuff it down the hatch, almost smother Ian Burns as they're pulling it down. And now Kookaburra coming hard and on to the breeze. So one minute 16 behind, Kookaburra has lost five seconds now as they go to the final three and a quarter nautical miles. Let's recap the race so far. Stars and Stripes winning the start. Connor absolutely magnificent, five second advantage. And when they crossed in front, they controlled it to round the top mark by 26 seconds. Lost, lost a little on the downhill slide, but on the second beat to win with, that's the third leg of the race, really moved away to lead by 42 seconds and extended that advantage under Spinnaker on the reaches. Um, then on the sixth leg of the race or the third beat to win with a game dominant in the Fremantle Doctor southwesterly of 18 to 20 knots, one minute and 11 seconds. And then on the spinnaker slide downhill, they've extended out to one minute and 16 seconds as they are now heading on the final leg of this fourth race of the 26th defense of the America's Cup. We'll be back after this break.
Stars and Stripes left of screen, leading the way over Kookaburra, round the mark by a minute 16. They're on the last leg. The final beat to win Wood, and victory will belong to Stars and Stripes. The uh, America's Cup will belong to the United States. And there in San Diego, you can see them glued around their TV sets, the pictures coming to them live from Australia. Although they're in the middle of an ad break at the moment, somebody's got to pay the bills. And as you can see, they are really pretty pleased with themselves. As I said, they've put a lot of effort, a lot of time, a lot of support, a lot of money into the Sail America campaign, the Stars and Stripes Syndicate, and they're about to see it bear fruit with Dennis Connor on the uh, home run, the final leg of this race. Kookaburra, the boys working, they've worked as hard as they possibly can. They've tried everything they can possibly try. The boat, as it is, moves pretty well for them. The sails are great, the crew work is great. The boat in front is better. That's a pretty uh, disheartening thing to have to uh, admit, but I think secretly they admitted it to themselves uh, a couple of days ago, Chris. Well, I think, uh, sure, they realised a few days ago that the uh, blue boat was a little bit quicker than their boat, but uh, looking at Ian Murray and uh, Peter Gilmore and friends' uh, faces going out this morning, uh, they were going out there fighting today, and I think they're still fighting out there now. They, uh, they know the odds are against them, they know that uh, the, the boat in front does have an edge on them, but uh, all they can do is keep at it, and I, the guys I saw go out this morning hadn't given up, they certainly hadn't thrown the towel, and, and they were going out there fighting today, we've seen them fight hard. It's a little bit hard to keep going when you're behind like that, but uh, this time around the, the experience on the uh, Stars and Stripes team has just beaten the professionals on Kookaburra. Keep in mind the, the average age in the cockpit of Stars and Stripes is I think 38, and the average age in the cockpit of, Cook of, the, of Kookaburra 3 is 29. So certainly a lot of experience up there on Stars and Stripes, but uh, Kookaburra just not, didn't quite have the legs to match them. And Stars and Stripes working away on this final beat now. Kookaburra hanging on here, it would know, be easy to say that they should be throwing in tack after tack, but they're working out quite nicely to weather of Stars and Stripes. They still take, I think they're probably taking a little bit of time out of Stars and Stripes at the moment, so no, you know, no point in tacking away because if Stars and Stripes doesn't want to follow, they won't. Slightly dejected uh, team on board Vulture there, I guess, but uh, not a lot more they can do. Interesting, Mr. Kevin Parry's proposition last evening where he's offered to lead a $50 million campaign to recapture this cup if they lose it. And I think that he has in Ian Murray, Peter Gilmore, and Colin Bishop. I think a formidable group of young sailors, and they have nine or ten years, there's three more challenges of defense. It's time scale to get them to Dennis's age and Dennis's group. And I think that they have the competence and they have the underlying talent to be tough in this game for a long time to come. I think Colin Bishop perhaps got the rough end of the stick here in reputation terms. I think he is also highly competent. He's a quiet personality, but I think he's an achiever. And with Ian, with Peter, and with Colin, Grant Simmer and his other team, they'll be tough. Chris, you know that, we know that. We're going to have to face them for many years to come. Yep, that's, that's for sure, Harold. Certainly those guys on Kookaburra are beginning a lot tougher coming up this final beat. But back on board Stars and Stripes now, nothing's changed too much. The guys are still down, sitting down quietly on board the boat, just working steadily away. Viewers through uh, South Australia and Queensland leaving us at this point for news. Okay, Dennis Connors, this is it. He's approaching a win for America's Cup. The Cup he won in 1980, lost in 1983. Now he's going to take it again. There'll be a lot of vindication, and I told you so. Not to us over here, but back at home. He took an enormous uh, burden of blame in America. The one thing the Americans do not like is failure, and he was perceived to have failed in 1983. He would defend himself saying that he failed with honor, that he showed he was a fighter, and that he was. And he went off quietly. He had a pretty understated campaign. He didn't project himself very much. He didn't claim too much. He went off for a couple of years, somewhat bitter years, because the burden of work was not supported by a generous funding. Adequate funding, but not generous. They struggled right through earlier this year. They were, in fact, quite short of money. They struggled to build this final boat, and this is the boat that's going to take the America's Cup, it looks like. And Dennis will have vindicated himself, and in doing so, vindicated America generally and their talents, their ability to organize, their technology, above all, their sheer competitiveness. Well, I'm sorry. 
Okay, Chris. These are going to be lot. This is going to be a long 20 final 25 minutes for the teams on both boats out there at the moment. For the guys on Stars and Stripes, uh, that finish line is up there. They know it's there, but uh, just getting there. You know, each second ticking by is just another second closer. But they'll be dragging out. So again, every creak, every groan, they'll be praying that the rig stays in the boat. They'll be praying the boat doesn't fall apart. That some un unseen fitting isn't going to fail. And on board Kookaburra, the thoughts going through their minds right now, I don't think any of us could really appreciate just how hard those guys are going to be taking it right now. Race isn't over, finish line is still up there. The uh, blue boat hasn't beaten them yet, but uh, they know that the games, the days are numbered, their hours are numbered, in fact, their minutes are numbered. Out on Stars and Stripes, they'll be, you know, holding the lucky rabbit's feet and that sort of stuff. I wonder what sort of lucky charm Buddy Melgus has. Buddy, are you out there? with us? Buddy, uh... Well, since he's not with us, let's just imagine. Yep. I would probably be at Duxford from up the, the Midwest. <laughs> I think uh, this is the sort of moment where all the old superstitions that go with seagoing uh, come to the fore. And it's in moments like this you have sympathy with the seamen of old, those that travel around the world before communication when it took a couple of years to get to Australia and back again. People right back to Cook's time. And they were people of superstition and they were people of prejudice and all that. And in moments like this, when you're heading for a success, this is when these superstitions come whirling back in, isn't it, Chris? That's for sure. We see uh, Kookaburra's actually tacked away now. And uh, they've obviously lived for long enough on the weather hip of Stars and Stripes. I think they probably took a little bit out of Stars and Stripes for a while there. Maybe lifted two or three boat links up on them, but tacked away now, probably on a little bit of a shift. It'll be interesting to see how long Stars and Stripes keeps going, but Stars and Stripes out the back there, still going on port, still showing that, uh, that absolute confidence of the, that they've had for so long now. Not interested in covering even that's the final lead of, the, uh, of this last, well, for them, probably last race. Very dejected looking, uh, what's that? Very dejected navigator looking navigator at the back, the back yes. there. Very dejected looking Ian Murray, but they've got to keep going, they've got to keep working away, and uh, losing by a minute or two minutes or losing by 10 seconds doesn't matter there. That's They're Ian Burns, the red cap on, standing and looking down at his feet there, hands crossed in front of him. The computer, uh, computer screen's actually behind him, so he's not looking at numbers. He's uh, deep reflection right he's now. He's just changed channel. <laughs> well, we'll Buddy do the same. The, sorry, I, I gather Buddy's back with us now. Buddy, we were just saying, what lucky charm do you carry? We're reckoning these boys in Stars and Stripes to be holding the rabbit's feet or whatever. What do you use? Well, I never really gave that much thought. I thought that uh, skill and cunning uh, was better than luck any time. In other words, I, as I see it out here with Dennis Connor. Uh, luck's got nothing to do with it, Harold. It looks like it's all skill to me. Well, to back that one up, buddy, there's a uh, saying I was told a long time ago, the, uh, the luck goes to the good guys, and the guys that have worked hardest or the guys that have achieved the most are getting the luck on their side as well, and I think they've worked very, very hard for it on board Stars and Stripes today. Well, as John Marshall and I were speaking yesterday, uh, in our experiences with sailing uh, one design boats and large fleets and everything else, and as we start to windward in our class and we look over and there's the four smartest guys in the class going uh, on the opposite direction that you're going and you say to yourself, now what are those stupid guys doing over there? Uh, you're the stupid one. You better join in and follow the smart guys because uh, they always seem to get to the windward mark first and uh, any young sailor that might be watching this telecast with aspirations to become a top-notch sailor like Dennis Conner. It's just hard work. It's, it's uh, getting to know Mother Nature, uh, going against the sea, the, the air, uh, the wind that blows on your sails, and know a little bit about aerodynamics, uh, hydrodynamics, a few things like that. Get some smart people around you, and then go to work on it. And the more you practice, the better you get. I don't care if it's south and yachting, uh, out here racing for the America's Cup, whether it's uh, sailing a laser, Dingy, but uh, or even playing football. Practice makes perfect, and Dennis is the master at that. Stars and stripes cleaving through the water on this final beat to windward, coming up towards the finish. About uh, another uh, 14 minutes or so away from the finish of this fourth race of the America's Cup. Welcome back, viewers in Victoria, just rejoining our telecast as we go on board Kookaburra. Paul Westlake, the starboard trimmer there, still doing his job, still eager, still keen, but uh, he's really uh, 
hoping against hope that something might happen here on the final leg that will put Kookaburra back into it. They've chased and chased as close as they could after Stars and Stripes all day. But Stars and Stripes continues to take ground off the Australian defender. And uh, Dennis Connor looks as though he's heading for a clean sweep victory. It won't be the first clean sweep victory in an America's Cup, but it'll be the first time that a defender has lost the cup without winning a race, Jeff Merrill. Well, yeah, that's absolutely right, Gary. In fact, the last time the Cup was won with a perfect 4-0 record was back in 1977 when Ted Turner skippered Courageous and defeated Noel Robbins in Australia. The United States has won the America's Cup 18 times with perfect all-win and no-loss records. Today, if they win, it'll be the 19th time the United States has done that, pretty much dominating the America's Cup competition. On screen, Kookaburra looking a little lonely on the Silver Sea stars and stripes out of shot heading for the finish as we head back to Buddy Melgens. Well, they're sailing along and that's about all you can say. They're sailing along. They're going through the motions now to get up to this uh, finish line. I'm sure everybody uh, on board stars and stripes is pleased and proud that it's over. And I'm sure that the boys on board Kookaburra 3 are just glad it's over. They don't the, need to be punished any longer, Peter. The only boats now that uh, are not around the finish, it's an instant almost city growing up uh, right up by the windward mark with a horseshoe of boats of all shapes and sizes, some very big boats, magnificent motor yachts up at the uh, top windward mark, and the rest are the boats with the privilege flag uh, still uh, just coming along behind uh, Kookaburra and Stars and Stripes. And the wind is still coming from the southwest, a direction uh, for just around 200 or just a little more, 205, and it's 16, 17 uh, knots at this stage. But really, buddy, it's, uh, there's not too much we can say now because uh, uh, Kookaburra is just so far off the pace. Uh, Stars and Stripes have been absolutely outstanding. Well, the Cooker Burrow is uh, sailing quite nicely through the water. She, uh, you can see the boys haven't completely given up, but there's not much they can do, as you said, Peter. Stars and Stripes has just got uh, too much speed to cope with out here on Gage Roads and uh, the, what I call, most ideal racing conditions that a yachtsman could find any place in the world. Buddy, Dennis Connor will... Uh Give great uh, coverage across the world as the first skipper to lose and now regain the America's Cup. But uh, the probably one of the key differences between this campaign and the 1983 campaign uh, that he has been backed by some excellent people. Marlon Berman, who's chairman of a big bank in California, has been president of the campaign and had his foot in some of the key boardrooms of corporate America. Also, other talented people, like you mentioned, John Marshall, the design coordinator, who was main sheet man aboard Liberty and Freedom going back to 1983 and 1980. And uh, so they've been uh, talented uh, people. Uh, Robert Hopkins, the sailing coach. So this time, it's much more than just Dennis Connor, isn't it? Key, talented American sailors backing up the Stars and Stripes campaign. Dennis has got the people behind him, with him, around him that he needs and he needed to uh, regain the America's Cup. There's no question that Dennis has not missed one particle of information needed, of one piece of technology, of one piece of equipment that would hold him from winning the America's Cup. He's done it all, Peter. So, uh, Chris and Harold, do you think the, this event will uh, be changed forever? The America's Cup, the yachting possibly even changed with the fantastic media coverage, 2,800 registered media people only. The Olympic Games or World Cup uh, soccer has more media people. Well, Peter, it obviously is a very, very big international event now. It's come a long, long way in the last uh, three or four years, and I'm sure that World Championships in Sardinia this year and World Championships each year and America's Cup in three or four years' time is going to be an equally big event, if not bigger again. But uh, as far as the sport itself goes, uh, I hope it's not going back to the United States for another 132 years. I think if the uh, challenges each time around can have the strengths that the challenge we've seen in the challenges in this, this America's Cup, well, hopefully uh, three or four years from now we might see it uh, moving away from the defender again. I think uh, Western Australia has provided a very special venue for this America's Cup. It's a small area in terms of population, but not small in terms of ambition or uh, initiative or ability. It's a wealthy area. 
and West Australia decided that they would promote America's Cup to represent, in a sense, the best that West Australia could do, and Australia generally. And one of the aspects that they certainly got right here, besides the generally good atmosphere and hospitality, was the television technology. Introducing race cam, I think, was the single greatest step, and this is a seven technology, was the single greatest step to improve access for the general public on board 12-meter sailing to sailing generally. It's the first time that sailing has been popularized. And I think there's no looking back from that. And I see sailing developing, particularly 12-meter sailing, as a major world sport in public terms. It always has been a major sport in competitors' terms. But now I think the public are going to join that tremendous excitement of being involved in it. And in years to come, Dennis and the Americans and others will look and say, well, the television started in Western Australia. Three quarters of the way down the final leg of this America's Cup. We'll be back for the finish after this break. Kookaburra on screen, but stars and stripes leading and within sight of victory, Harold. Even though the race is virtually a foregone conclusion, the tension will be enormous in stars and stripes. This is the end of three and a half years of planning, of perhaps two and a half years of effort, 15 million US dollars, that's nearly 25 million Australian dollars of spending, ambition, uh, struggle, um, coming back from the cold in a sense for this team. This is the team that lost the cup. They're outside. They have so much, not alone to win, but to vindicate themselves, to prove to their country and their people and all around the Castigellan for losing the cup that they're actually competent and they, they're bringing it back to America. On attacks, and you can see still in view, Kookaburra, but uh, tailing out behind and with uh, no chance now, unless something untoward were to happen, of overhauling stars and stripes. But even for the uh, the loser in this final or the losers in this series, Chris Dixon, I would think that uh, most of the people, yourself included, would be backing up again. This was <laughs> the other way there. Hello, Mother. There's some wood stars and stripes there. We should jump onto that, sound that shot for a while. He's obviously a very, very happy crew. They've got, had, the, had the word to trim the Genoa back on for a little bit and uh, get back to racing. Guys, not quite there yet. 
Let's keep in mind what the Kookaburras have done, though, they, in beating uh, Australia 4. And to be in this final for the America's Cup, they beat the boat, so the team that, that won the America's Cup four years ago. They have done a great job, but Stars and Stripes on the way. I think that was probably their last tack for the finish line. This is the final sprint for them. They can, they've got it in sight, and they're charging in it uh, to get there as quick as they possibly can. Coming up on the finish as we go back to the Kookaburra tender with Peter Montgomery and Buddy Melgers. What a superb job the people of Fremantle, Perth and Western Australia have done in defending this great sporting prize. They've changed the shape of the event forever and the spectacular coverage by Australian television will be the benchmark for the future. This is the 366th race held for defenders and challengers out on Gage Road since October the 5th for Stars and Stripes in Kookaburra, their 47th race of the summer, and now the last. But as we're about to salute a great victory by Stars and Stripes crew, dominant in all conditions and all points of sailing in the four races sailed so far for a 4-0 win over Kookaburra, the shortest America's Cup since 1887, 100 years ago, Volunteer beat Thistle, then just two races in the series in four days. Back in modern times, let's remember Alan Bond. Without him, we wouldn't even be here. The hard-working people from the Royal Perth Yacht Club that organised the defence. The other defenders, Stakey and Kidney from Sydney, South Australia, Alan Bond's Australia 3 and Australia 4. The Kookaburra had to work hard to beat for the right and honour to defend the Cup for Australia. And the Tough Challenger series, a record 13 entries that sharpened Stars and Stripes' attack for this challenge. The other five American challengers, Courageous, USA, Eagle, Heart of America, America 2 for the New York Yacht Club that held the old mark for 132 years. The Italians, Azura and Italia, Challenge France and French Kiss, Canada 2. Britain's White Crusader and New Zealand finally beaten by Stars and Stripes in the Louis Vuitton Challengers final. All now chapters in someone else's book. But that chapter might say there's never been tougher eliminations to find a challenger or a defender in America's Cup racing. From the original lineup of 17 defenders and challengers trying to win international sports' oldest prize, there's just two boats remain, Kookaburra and Stars and Stripes, and very soon there'll be just one. Australia's inaugural defence of the America's Cup is over. Three years, four months and eight days since Alan Bond and his heroes on Australia 2 took the cup from the New York Yacht Club and ended the longest winning streak in the history of sport back on the 26th of September 1983. Now on the 4th of February 1987, out on Gage Road, Western Australia, we're about to see the climax of one of the greatest sporting comebacks in history. If the film Rocky had been about yachting, there'd be no need for fiction. The Dennis Connor story is about the first skipper to lose the America's Cup, and now the first skipper to win back yachting's heavyweight crown. The America's Cup is America's again. The gun for Stars and Stripes, the fourth successive victory in five days, ending the shortest America's Cup in 100 years. United States 4, Australia nil. Great joy amongst the crew of Stars and Stripes. Scott Vogel on the bow, John Barnett at the mast, Jay Brown the mast pitman, Kyle Smith, one of the big grinders who alternated with Henry Childers, Jim Cavley, the other grinder who was there for all four races, Adam Ostenfeld, John Wright, Peter Eisler, Tom Whitten and Dennis Connor. And real delight for a five of the Liberty crew beaten by Australia 2 back on September the 26, 1983. Tom Whitten, the tactician, John Wright, Taylor then, now the main sheep man, Kyle Smith the grinder and Scott Vogel the bowman. And also today, Adam Ostenfeld and Bill Trenkel, they were Liberty Reserves and they have joined the skipper Dennis Connor in coming back in a magnificent comeback. And so, if there was one word that summarized 1983, it was, that's the San Diego Yacht Club, great joy and delight. And Dennis Connor, Thumbs up to the crowd, absolutely delighted. And if there was one word that summarized 1983 upset, in 1987, it is comeback by Dennis Connor. Absolutely magnificent. 
People said that he was doing the wrong thing going to Hawaii, rushing back to San Diego, but in the end, he's proved them all wrong with his all-American heroes. Absolutely magnificent performance as Dennis Connor and his crew salute the vast number of people out here on Gage Road to see sporting history made. And still, Kookaburra coming up. Let's not forget these valiant Australians who never gave up throughout the contest. They had a slower boat. That's just too tough to beat. But they've been marvellous in a first-up campaign. And they did well, of course, to even beat Alan Bond Syndicate for the right and honour to defend the Cup for Australia. So 1 minute 59 is the biggest defeat in the America's Cup so far. Race 1, 141. Race 2, 1 minute and 10 seconds. Race 3, 146. And 159, Kookaburra 3 has been beaten by Stars and Stripes. We'll be back after this break. Balloons are flying, the hoses are pumping out on gauge roads and on board uh, Stars and Stripes. They're breaking out the champagne, having defeated Kookaburra by 1 minute 59 seconds to win this final race, or final race as it turned out, to take back the America's Cup lost in 1983 to Australia 2 and taken back today. The champers doing the rounds there. On board, the boys really enjoying this, wasting a little bit of it, but why not? They can afford to at this stage of the day. Peter Eisler and Tom Whitten there with uh, Adam Ostenfeld. Uh, Kyle Smith, John Barnett, all getting into it. They've had a long and a hard campaign, but uh, it's certainly paid off over the past week, winning four races to zero here over Kookaburra 3. And on board Kookaburra, it's a slightly different scene. Having a quiet snack, an apple there. Greg Cavill on a, munching on an apple. Biscuits and sandwiches for the rest of the guys, but all the champagne is on board Stars and Stripes. All the jubilation is on board Stars and Stripes. Ian Murray at the wheel can still afford just a faint smile as the chase boat comes on board. Commiserations from the rest of the crew. They tried hard, but it didn't work. So with uh, the huge spectator fleet, fleet milling around, Alex Murray coming on board to join husband Ian and the rest of the crew because she's worked just as hard as uh, most of them have here at the dockside right throughout this long cup campaign, helping with all the behind the scenes details. Kevin Parry coming on board as well, the man who's bankrolled this effort to the tune of $28 million and who's prepared to back up again in 1990 with a budget of another $50 million. Kookaburra on the losing side, Dennis Connor taking off the America's Cup 
in 1987. Viewers leaving us through New Zealand at the moment, nice to have had you with us. And for viewers around Australia, we'll be back after this break. Back on Gage Road, a huge jumble of craft. There's Kookaburra in the foreground. The crew acknowledging the waves of spectators on board the adjoining uh, fleet. And when I say fleet, that's exactly what it is. A huge armada of boats out there today, jam-packed with people. There it is. They've enjoyed this spectacle over the past uh, week and, of course, the past months. Those that have been lucky to be here right through the period. The yachts surrounded by craft, as you can see. Every manner, every shape of... Uh, boat afloat has been out there today and as we saw earlier one of them didn't remain afloat huge ocean liners small runabouts now on board stars and stripes they still can't believe it all the other members of the syndicate the backup crew the support crew jumping on board to join dennis connor and the rest of the crew in the celebration this really has been an historic day and historic event for these people having lost the cup the determination the support the finance to be able to come down here and take it back despite all the odds Dennis Connor has proved again what a master he is at 12 meter sailing with the backup team that he's had the designers that he's had to produce this boat produce these sails and with the assistance of the other American syndicates that were involved earlier in the challenge they've come along and they've taken the cup and they've not only just taken it they have taken it comprehensively convincingly by four races to zero now they can afford to smile and relax and shake hands and celebrate and have a drink because the hard work is done for the time being. Cup defence now, of course, is three years away. They'll be thinking about that, though, as soon as their feet hit dry land. So Stars and Stripes defeats Kookaburra 3, four races to zero to win the America's Cup. Heading back to uh, Fishing Boat Harbour, and they're not the first to head back already. Quite a few boats are headed back, and already crowds are thronging to the foreshore. Thousands upon thousands of people waiting for the spectacle that they're going to see here 
in about another uh, 25 or 30 minutes when these boats head back in. In the meantime, let's go back and see what's happening with Ian Hislop in San Diego. San Diego Yacht Club, they're going berserk, as you can see. Ian Hislop trying to fight his way through the crowd, but in the melee there, he's been separated from his microphone. We've lost him for the moment. All those riotous. These glasses empty, as you can see, but uh, obviously it hasn't been all night. They tell me that uh, the Americans have won the America's Cup. Is that correct? I think it's a rumor. I'm not sure that it's confirmed yet. We'll have to, we'll have to watch the telly. <laughs> But maybe, just maybe, it's true! <laughs> All right. We think that the Aussies had a lot. Well, I think that uh, they're going to have a headache in the morning. <laughs> Out on the water with the uh, police boats, the harbours and marine, the spectator craft, and that's been a big factor in this uh, whole regatta, keeping control of the number of craft out there and the people that have been out on the water. There must have been 15 or 20,000 people out on the water there today to see what has turned out to be the final race of the America's Cup Series and the victory of Stars and Stripes. The man who's closer to it than I am is Peter Montgomery. Well, it's been a real privilege to be out here on Gage Road today, to be part of sporting history and Dennis Connor and his talented crew regaining the America's Cup in the 26th defense, the first time it has been ever held outside the United States. And Ian Murray made the comment the other night at the press conference when someone asked him what happens if he keeps losing, uh, knowing the way cricket fans perhaps treat the Australian cricket team, he said he hopes it doesn't happen that way, the way it does at the cricket out here. Well, it certainly hasn't, but he has it. Uh, the Kookaburra 3 right here beside us is really being saluted by boat after boat of Australians who have been very proud with the gutsy effort they've been put up and I think that most people would understand that if you've got a boat that's doing 8.5, 8.6 knots uh, on the wind and you've got a boat doing 8.3 then really the Australians had an uphill task and they fought hard for Australians honour. Well a couple of hundredths of a knot is, is what's been the decisive factor in uh, Dennis Connor's favour. He did a wonderful job in putting together an effort over these last three years he trained in uh, Hawaii. We thought he was probably going to have the fastest two slow boats in the world, but then his design team went back to work and, in fact, made us all liars. And out here today, he finished it off with a blazing uh, victory over Kookaburra 3. And I tell you what, the Australians are no question. They have to be proud of Kookaburra 3, the great job that they have done coming on like they have and finally defeating Australia 4 for the right to defend the club. They did not do it successfully, but it's my understanding they're going after Dennis. They're going to take him on his home court, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Dennis has his hands more than full in 1993 trying to defend the cup against Australia. Well, there's an absolute cavalry charge out here. It is really white water everywhere, white rapids. And uh, the boats, some of the smaller ones, are really getting tossed around, at least on some of the bigger boats. The journey home is a little more comfortable. It really is a marvellous spectacle and equal to really anything seen in Newport, Rhode Island, buddy. This is just great. Well, I've never seen anything like this before. Of course, I don't spend much time in Newport. I never felt I wanted to defend the cup. I only wanted to win it for the heart of America. We've not been able to do that, but I'm very, very, very proud of what exactly So there is US 55, Stars and Stripes, sailing home and they're being bombarded with people going by, waving, cheering, and the folk who enjoy the Stars and Stripes. There's a, uh, a film boat from ABC Television in America, and uh, of course all the networks down here in Fremantle uh, reporting this action and probably they gave bigger coverage since the America's Cup is out of Newport, Rhode Island than in fact they gave when it was there. ESPN, the sports network, carrying it live across America, starting at around midnight uh, New York time, but if you're living in California where San Diego is ideal, nine o'clock at night the race started, and so it got extensive coverage over there, which is great for Fremantle and Perth, great for Western Australia, and certainly marvelous for yachting in the super conditions out on Gage Roads. So the crew aboard Stars and Stripes and Kookaburra 
They'll have tired arms tonight, no much, not so much from the physical effort in the race four of the 26 defence, but waving to well wishes. And there you can see the Kookaburra crew are getting a tremendous reception, and it's certainly not uh, the tough reception that the Australian cricket team get when they're getting beaten, because these fellows are coming home heroes. It was amazing to uh, be out uh, on the Kookaburra tender this morning with the farewell. Uh, I've never quite experienced anything like that. Absolutely amazing. If someone told me there's 50, 60, 70,000 people on every rock, every cranny available uh, as Kookaburra left, and they got a magnificent reception. So uh, the people who were there were certainly very much behind them, and I would expect the same kind of reception that they're beaten heroes, but still very, very much uh, admired for putting up a tough defence. After all, they beat the Bond Syndicate that won the Cup, and uh, there were some very talented sailors aboard Australia 4. They weren't an easy pushover, and in their first ever America's Cup campaign, to be able to achieve what they have is highly commendable as well. So, although they're a little disappointed, they can still savour some of that as uh, they're charging through the white water here. Really, it's like being at one of the big surf beaches uh, out off uh, Cottesloe or one of the great beaches that seem to go forever here out off metropolitan Perth or maybe uh, some of the great Sydney beaches. It's just white caps everywhere, buddy. This is not like Lake Geneva in Wisconsin, is it? No, certainly not. It's, uh, it's really something to see these spectator boats charging around, everybody wanting to congratulate Kookaburra 3 on their valiant effort, even in defeat. So, as Kookaburra sails home, trailing behind the man of the moment, the Stars and Stripes crew will be back after this break. Boats are beginning to fill up in the harbour. There won't be much space when these uh, sailing boats get back in later. That's the flag up on top of Kookaburra 2's mast. Just, that's just behind where we are, so we're keeping an eye on it. As we're talking to you, we're looking over our shoulders and seeing the crowds out there. There's a great atmosphere down there. We can hear through our supposedly soundproof studio all sorts of yelling and shouting. This is down on the Kookaburra dock. Wives and girlfriends, children waiting anxiously for the boys to come back because they'll need a little consolation. But these fellas won't. It's going to be all hell break loose when Stars and Stripes returns to port here this afternoon. Not long now. The crew, the backup, the support people all on board, lining the side there and acknowledging the cheers and the waves from uh, their tender and from all the other spectator craft, from the harbour and marine craft. It really is... Uh, I've never seen the like of it. Chris, have you? Never before, Gary. Uh, it's going to be pan pandemonium's going to break loose when they get back into the dock here. I, uh, I imagine that 
They'll want to set, try and sail Stars and Stripes around inside the harbour for a while, and that will make the place go absolutely chaotic. I think there are a, a rough estimate of 50 or 60,000 people down at the dock this morning for the departure, and looking out the window now, there's going to be even more people down here to welcome the boats back. I think it won't be just for Stars and Stripes. There's a lot of Kookaburra flags flying as well, so hopefully Ian Murray and the team are going to have a lot of fans welcome them back, even though they haven't done what they went out there to do. That's the view out uh, our window. I uh, the privilege of watching Australia win the America's Cup in Newport from a helicopter. And uh, that was a bit of a, a naughty way of doing it because we just took it out for the second half of the race, watched the race, came back in. When the boat hit the dock, I was a guest uh, on, down on the Australian dock. In fact, we stood on Challenge 12 with Ian Murray and several other people. Derry Clark was there, people of the Cooper crew. And we watched the crowd come ashore. The reception was static, as you know. It was, it's recorded on film from that time. And now the situation has been reversed. And this crowd, this Australian crowd, is here to cheer for the winner and to console the loser. And this is a fantastic atmosphere here. Kukubara is coming up over the horizon. It won't be too long before she gets in. She still has her Genoa up. You can see her along there. The boats are close in. The little chase boats behind them. The yachts, the spectator boats, the motor boats, the big catamarans, and the ocean liners, of course, who have been uh, occupying the horizon around this race course for this last week. And in the background, low in the square rigger. It's just a fantastic atmosphere altogether. Oh, look at that, there's some excitement there. Can't see which boat they're on. What's, what's snowed down? What do you think, Chris? Well, I think obviously American supporters, but it doesn't matter whether they're American supporters or Australian supporters. Uh, we see a lot of flags out there from uh, a, lot of the, a lot of Stars and Stripes flags and a lot of the blue Australian flag as well. So a lot of people welcoming both, backs, both, both boats back this evening. And it's going to be seriously. It's going to be absolutely chaotic when these boats get back in. How all the uh, all these spectator boats and all the crowds are going to fit into Challenge Harbour at the same time, I'm not really sure. But it's lining up to be a big one, Harold. I think it's going to be even wilder than New Year's Eve, if you remember that down here. Wall to wall people, right through Fremantle, and there's a lot of space in this town. I think uh, hopefully the crowds going to be live and be able to live these guys up a little bit when they come in. Not a lot to be happy about for them, but. Uh, Hopefully they'll be smiling uh, by the time they get back in. A lot of support for those guys still. They did do a great job out there. They did their best. The odds were against them, and uh, the best is all you can ask of them. I think they've done a great job. Lombardo's in action. Uh, people spilling out the doors and windows and even occupying the roof. Absolutely fantastic. Better check the trees in the background. Can we see anybody up there? <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. Just absolutely jam-packed the whole way around these harbors. The atmosphere is electric here. Sensational stuff, but uh, right now it's time to get back out on the water with Buddy Melgers. And Buddy, just before we come to you, we've got a very important message for you. God bless the cooker, God bless the cooker. The heart of a nation goes with cooker to sea. As she lets go her sails and she hoists up her spinnaker. We love you, cooker, and we're proud as can be. Oh, we will applaud that in the studio, right, everyone? <laughs> well, Buddy Melgers, there's the fat lady. What do you think now? The fat lady is <laughs> Oh, that's just great. <laughs> Buddy, all we need is the nurse, and everybody's here. <laughs> well, let's hope.